So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the educational workshop on proteostasis and protein misfolding disorders in the, in the central nervous system. My name is Lana Blintz. I will be moderating, or rather I'm the chair for the workshop and I will be moderating the discussions. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors because the workshop was sponsored by Ibro Pan European Research Grant and by European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program, COGDEC. Um, as before, if you have any questions, please submit them via Slido, especially if you've already filled out the form to receive CME credits or certificate of attendance. Um, there will be a bit of time at the end of the lecture, most likely for a short discussion, but any questions exceeding the available time will be then sent to the lecture. And now our first speaker is Professor Richard Morimoto, who is the Bill and Gail Cook Professor of Biology and the Director of Rice Institute um, in, at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And in his lecture, he will present how proteostasis network collapse contributes to aging and neurodegeneration. Professor Morimoto, the stage is yours. Thank you. Let me open up my slides. Lana, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this workshop. Today in my talk, what I will tell you about is protein quality control and its essential role in maintaining a healthy cell the risk for failure in aging and neurodegenerative diseases. What I'm showing you here is a landscape diagram where every polypeptide enters in at the highest energy state, the extended polypeptide. And for every protein, it can form intramolecular contacts that form the native states. And these native states, of course, can also be populated uh, by folding intermediates and partially folded states. What's interesting for every protein is that it can also transition into intermolecular contacts. If the hydrophobic regions associate, you can then get ordered oligomers that become amyloid fibrils and amorphous aggregates. This is fundamental for every protein in the cell, both inside and outside, is at risk for failure. And we know well that proteins that are highly amyloidogenic have a lag phase where the monomers form oligomers these oligomers then over a very long period of growth phase then form these saturation amyloid species. What's fascinating, if you look at MRIs using uh, dyes, sorry, dyes that can stain uh, tau, for example, is that in Alzheimer's brain, you have a dramatic increase in the amount of these amyloid species. But likewise, in concussive injury, that can occur in football or in military. What's fascinating about these amyloid species is the diversity of structures that are available. So for example, if one just takes tau, that there are literally dozens of different amyloid structures that have been identified by crystallography and cryo-EM. What's interesting, of course, is that these structures form these very precise orientations. They have not only the amyloid core as indicated in the blue, but the sequences that don't form the amyloid core form these local disordered regions. And what's fascinating is that these highly amyloidogenic proteins are highly abundant in our cells, and these seeds can be initiated by homopolymers, for example, glutamine, asparagine rich, uh, that are often found in prions or low complexity regions. We have to keep in mind that the fundamentals of proteins folding into soluble, soluble globular states like myoglobin or shifting into the amyloid with the characteristic 4.6 angstrom and 10 angstrom spacing can occur just by changing the solubility and the ionic environment in pH. So this is myoglobin in one structure as a soluble protein that we know it to be, and here's myoglobin as amyloid as it first demonstrated by Chris Dobson's laboratory. Our laboratory has been very interested in the importance of how this is maintained, how every polypeptide folds on pathway to native states. These of course are reversible reactions. Uh, depending on the environment or promoted by mutations, uh, proteins can go off pathway where they form oligomers and aggregates. 
fortunately, our cells co-evolved, probably pre-evolved the molecular chaperones to ensure folding to the native state, but they also brought forth the activities of molecular chaperones and the autophagic and the um, ubiquitin proteasome system to prevent these off-pathway intermediates from forming. The challenge in biology is how do you form a properly folded native protein in the face of tremendous numbers of polymorphisms that occur within the uh, coding regions or changes in expression or splicing uh, of, of RNAs that encode these proteins. And of course, uh, you have tremendous amount of biosynthetic errors in the hundreds of steps from expressing a gene, uh, transcribing, splicing, export, translation, folding. And of course, anytime you have flux in ATP levels, since the synthesis of a protein and degradation requires a round of ATP hydrolysis for every event. Proteostasis then is a concept that brings together the integration of the complexity, the regulatory pathways between function and dysfunction. And what we'll talk about today is the role of aging, of course, proteotoxic damage as in neurodegenerative diseases. So the problem is that when proteins do not move all the way towards native states, they can then populate the misfolded state. And we know this well. Perhaps the most prominent of these are called amyloidoses in Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and AD. But to remind you that if you have misfolding, you can get premature degradation as occurs in Delta F508 for CFTR leading to cystic fibrosis or mutations in alpha-1 antitrypsin lead to improper trafficking leading to emphysema. The point is, that there are many hundreds of human diseases, such as cataracts, such as uh, cystic fibrosis, as inclusion body myositis shown here, and of course the neurodegenerative diseases, but including uh, type two diabetes and the P P53 dependent cancers, where these are all protein folding diseases. So the challenge to the cell is how to then maintain proteostasis. The balance between these chaperones clearance mechanisms and the mutations and the challenge. The stress of aging, of course, causes this imbalance, which then causes proteins like alpha-synuclein, Huntington, tau, and A-beta to precipitate even more aggressively. And then the opportunity of small molecule proteostasis regulators by enhancing chaperones, by stimulating the clearance mechanisms to restore balance in the cell. So this idea of a proteostasis network then is really central to how we manage the complexity of polymorphisms and folding and function, and to appreciate that the challenge then when you have disease associated mutations against the tauopathies, the Huntington's, the A-betas, the synucleans, is that challenges the capacity of the proteostasis network leading to cellular dysfunction. And of course, perhaps the biggest challenge is the effect of aging. Why does aging then, the increased mistranslation, the accumulation of protein damage, then stimulate this cycle? So when we were thinking about how to address this problem, we were very attracted to Huntington's disease because as many of you know, Huntington's disease leads to this dramatic loss in the striatum, the appearance of aggregates. And of course, once diagnosed with Huntington's disease, this is a movie from Nancy Wexler, uh, who led the initial team that identified the Huntington mutation. Um, Max Perutz himself, in one of his last papers, had put forth a very exciting speculative model that the polyglutamine stretch itself would form these perfect hydrogen bonded stretches that would then uh, form these amazing amyloids. So we reasoned that maybe we could induce proteotoxic stress from within inside the cell by expressing just polyglutamine. So we did that. At that point, we shifted into using C. elegans as a model system. And we uh, then made a whole series of different length polyglutamine YFP animals. And uh, for those who are less familiar, C. elegans is a remarkable animal because it's a 60 hour life cycle. It lives about two to three weeks. There's exactly 959 cells and the animal's transparent in all of its life stages. So if you express, for example, a short polyglutamine, 
Uh, we know that the threshold in humans is that about 35 residues or lower, uh, and there's tremendous polymorphisms in that among, the, among humans, that the protein is absolutely soluble and there's no toxicity. However, if you now go to a polyglutamine expansion, for example, 82 glutamines, I think you can see that there's four animals here, all of whom are suffering severe motility defects, and the protein has shifted from a soluble to an aggregate. Shown in the right is actually an example of the comparison of five different lines of different length polyglutamine, a below threshold Q29, to just at the threshold Q33, 35, and then above threshold Q40 and Q82. And you can see there's a striking age-dependent aggregation. Whereas the intermediate cues, it's a very uh, striking age and gradual increase. Whereas as you go to 40 and 82, it takes off quite rapidly. Associated with aggregation, of course, is toxicity. The Q40 and Q82 animals have dramatic cellular toxicity, as you can see here with loss of motility. So we use this system as a way to then do discovery. What are the underlying genetics that control this? And we reasoned that maybe the genes involved in longevity in C. elegans protected the animal against proteotoxic stress. So Cynthia Kenyon and Gary Rufkin had identified the insulin signaling system conserved in all organisms as critical in longevity. So we did a simple experiment. We took these Q82 animals and you're looking at a unhatched embryo. And so you can see the dramatic polyglutamine aggregates. We then genetically cross them to, add to and we introduce the mutation that leads to longevity. And I think you can all see that the aggregates are gone and the protein actually has shifted from aggregate to soluble. Then we did another cross where we then knocked out the transcription factor that's regulated by DAF2H1 and that's called DAF16 or FOXO3. And you can see we now return to the highly aggregated state. And so these data are shown here quantitatively that we, we can, by making the animals long live, we can suppress aggregation quite dramatically. Moreover, you can see that these transcript, the, this process is regulated by transcription factors. So this is the lifespan of a normal animal. This is what happens when you introduce the age one mutation. And this is what happens in the dash lines when you knock out the transcription factor DAF16, which of course then leads to aggregation. You can see that there's a direct link then between these transcription factors, DAF16 and HSF1 as protecting against aggregation. And when you knock them out, they also shorten lifespan dramatically. So we use this system then as a way to interrogate the entire genome. We reason that having this collection of animals where you could have just YFP or going up to Q40. And I think you can see really elegantly how different lengths of polyglutamine have different outcomes. So at Q24, the protein's still soluble. And it's not just that it looks soluble by biochemical criteria, by biophysical imaging criteria. We know that the protein is soluble. But you can see at the threshold of Q35 to Q37, you can see now the very striking shift among the 95 body wall muscle cells that in some muscle cells you have aggregates, some cells it's still soluble. But we reason then that this would be a wonderful way to genetically screen for the modifiers. Moreover, you can see with the Q35 animals that if you start when the animals are young, day four in adulthood, the protein is soluble. And if you follow the same animal every three days, you can actually watch the appearance of these aggregates in real time. So we use this as a basis of a genetic screen to look for the genes that control the process. And that led to the discovery of the proteostasis network. And our surprise was that the proteostasis network was not just chaperones and the proteasome, but it starts with RNA synthesis and processing. And so we identified 38 genes involved in 
steps of transcription in splicing that directly affect protein aggregation. We identify many of the subunits of the ribosome and translation factors. In fact, the largest fraction of proteins are in protein synthesis. Then of course, chaperones, but interestingly, only 10 of the 200 chaperones, proteins involved in transport, and of course, proteins involved in degradation. So this was of course exciting because it provided the first insight on the composition of what we then were to call the proteostasis network. Now, the system is really fascinating because you can watch, as I said, the age dependent, and you can watch as the aggregates form in real time. Moreover, when you look at electron microscopy, you can see that these aggregates really are the 10 angstrom amyloid fibrils. Moreover, it's absolutely concentration dependent. So if, for example, you uh, take a homozygous animal that has two copies of this polyglutamine, and I'll just make it a heterozygote, you can see that alone is sufficient to change the kinetics, the rate of aggregate formation. Moreover, this allowed us to ask a question. So what you're looking at are the um, 95 body wall muscles. There's four of these tubes that run along the length of the animal. And what it allows us to do is we can see in yellow the appearance of each of the aggregates as they occur over time. And what, what, occurred, to, what occurred to us was that at the molecular level, each aggregate was forming independently, which meant that the animals were functionally autonomously. At the organismal level, there was no movement of the proteins between and that it was simply a time dependent without cooperativity with fast inclusion growth using four different cell line animals with different levels of the protein. This system also allowed us, again, you can see the different length polyglutamine to pose the question, why is aggregation toxic? And the way that we address this took advantage of the underlying genetics of C. elegans, which is that these animals are isogenic. So there is no polymorphism. So we reason that if we did a simple genetic experiment and introduce the polyglutamine into animals that harbored a missense mutation in proteins that had clear function, that we would be able to ask, does polyglutamine have an effect on a metastable protein? And so the metastable protein that I'm gonna show you first is paramycin a protein in the myofilament, in the sarcomere. And you can see that at the permissive temperature 15, you can see the striations of the muscle. At 25 degrees, by just shifting the temperature, the protein misfolds and it aggregates. So we did a simple genetic cross. We took this Q40 animal and just crossed it into the, in, into the TS mutation. So pay, this is important. There is no, uh, this is not a transgene, the TS protein is at its endogenous locus and it has a single missense allele. Normally, the protein never shows a phenotype as you can see at the permissive temperature. You only get a phenotype when the protein misfolds at the restrictive temperature. So when we did the experiment, we got a dramatic result. And what you can see here is that at 15 degrees in the presence of polyglutamine, now the paramycin TS completely misfolds. Just to remind you, without the polyglutamine, the paramycin is absolutely wild type and the animals have no motility defect. And this shows you the location of the polyglutamine in that muscle cell. And it was interesting that they did not coincide. So we've done these experiments in many different tissues. Here's a summary of the muscle cells, again, showing you the uh, features of the TS mutation and how as we go from YFP alone, it has no effect. If we go Q24, you'll remember below the threshold, the protein stays soluble. It has no effect on paramycin. But now as we introduce the Q35 or the Q40, you see increased proteotoxicity as reflected by the loss of paramycin. Just to show you another example in neurons, we look at dynamin, which is a large GTPase important for endocytic traffic. And you can see the TS is, uh, has no phenotype at the permissive temperature 15, and it is uh, lethal at the restrictive temperature. And if we now introduce a short polyglutamine in neurons or a long polyglutamine Q40, you can see with a short polyglutamine, there's no toxicity. Whereas when we introduce the Q40, 
with the Dynamon TS at the permissive temperature of 15 degrees, you get 100% toxicity. In other words, the polyglutamine toxicity is because it's causing other metastable proteins to subsequently misfold. Now, the other aspect of this experiment that's fascinating is that we can also ask, is there an acceleration in the polyglutamine phenotype because the missense mutation has now misfolded? In other words, is there a net consequence of misfolding? And so in this experiment, we're just looking at the number of polyglutamine 40 puncta in an animal that has a RAS mutation. And I think you can see quite dramatically that the number of aggregates goes up significantly. And likewise, here's the number of aggregates in a homozygous Q40. And if you now introduce that single missense mutation in paramycin, the aggregation yield goes up dramatically. And I think you can see this here quantitatively for RAS and for paramycin. I should also point out that while I made the comment earlier about these animals being isogenic, isn't it remarkable that we get this level of animal to animal variation, which really starts to tell us about the underlying subtlety from animal to animal, from cell to cell in the quality control machinery. So what this tells us is that proteostasis is extremely delicate and it's easy to become imbalanced. So what these studies have told us really is that under the normal circumstance of polymorphisms in our genome, which then result in mild folding variants, that the quality control machinery is sufficient in its capacity to allow folding and normal function. But if our genome encodes a single mutation, for example, a polyglutamine expansion, a P310L tau mutation, a mutation in A beta, that you now get the formation of a chronic aggregation prone protein. And that chronic aggregation prone protein now competes. And so instead of the mild folding variants of folding, they now misfold. This is important because it tells us that gain of function toxicity of aggregation is because of the interference of the aggregates, but as much it's because of the loss of function of other metastable proteins that misfold in the cell. So why is aggregation a problem? We think that protein mismanagement is likely the biggest challenge to the functional health of the proteome, leading to mislocalization, effects on protein half-life, loss of function or altered function, and aggregate inter induced interference with cellular function. The, and the question then is, are there distinct strategies to correct protein misfolding one at a time versus correcting the functional decline in proteostasis? So how, when, and why does protein function decline? Is it a gradual process or nonlinear? And can this predict when protein misfolding occurs relevant to therapeutic strategies? So in a review that John Labadia and I wrote, we put forth three obvious ideas for proteostasis decline in aging that in tissues from young to old, that there is a progressive decline in all tissues as you go from soluble to aggregate species. And the three lines correspond to three different tissues. The other possibility is that it's programmed and they all decline synchronously. The third possibility is tissue specific programs of collapse, that the red tissue is a gradual linear decline from young to old, the blue transitions in middle age, and the green transitions later in age. Therefore, the cells and tissues are functioning non autonomously. So, what I'd like to describe to you are experiments that we've done that draw a very clear, simple conclusion that proteostasis collapse in aging is genetically programmed and it occurs at the transition of reproduction. The insights in this really came from Anat ben -Zvi's experiments, again, using these temperature sensitive mutant proteins, where she just monitored a whole series of different TS proteins where there was no stress, no polyglutamine, just aging. And so what you can see in the top panel here 
is the immunolocalization of paramycin in wild type animals from day one to day 12. And you can see the striations of the myofilaments in an individual muscle cell. And you can quantify then the disruption as shown in black down here for the 95 body wall muscle cells as a function of age. And shown in the lower panel are a TS mutation where on day one, the striations are indistinguishable from wild type, but between day one and three and beyond, I think all of you can see that now the muscle cell is grossly disrupted by the aggregation of the paramycin. And so you can quantify this and you can see that 50% of the 95 body wall muscle cells have paramycin aggregates. And you can see that these aggregates are not subtle in size by about day four of adulthood of an animal that's going to live about 21 to 25 days. So we've done this for many other proteins and we get the, exactly the same results, whether it's in neurons for RAS or acetylcholine or GAS1, which is a mitochondrial matrix protein or another muscle protein, perlican. And shown in red, for example, for RAS, you can see that 50% of the temperature sensitive mutant RAS at the permissive temperature, but just because of aging, misfolds by day five. And it was interesting that whether it was RAS, paramycin, GAS1, myosin, that they all started failing. 50% uh, uh, of the cells exhibit failure by day four to day five. In other words, early in the lifespan. And when she then asked, is there an underlying uh, mechanism that could explain this? She looked at the heat shock response, which of course is the upstream transcription factor that regulates molecular chaperones. And you can see that four different chaperones decline dramatically between day one and day three, and I stay reduced, you know, up to 90% reduction in the inducibility of different heat shock genes. So this led to a very interesting idea. This suggested then by manipulating these chaperone systems by controlling the transcription factors, we could shift the quality control of folding. So this was done in a simple experiment where we first did RNAi. So if you knock out HSF1 or knock out DAF16, you'll remember that these were the transcription factors that were essential to, for uh, proteostasis in aging. And HSF1 is the upstream transcription factor for most molecular chaperones. And DAF16 is the upstream uh, transcription factor for small heat shock proteins. And you can see that if we knock down HSF1, the TS phenotype goes up from 1.5 to 2. And likewise for DAF16, if you knock out DAF16 by RNAi, the TS phenotype, the loss of function, is enhanced by twofold. Likewise, if we overexpress DAF16 or HSF1 in animals that have a dynamic TS mutation, you can see that we can suppress the loss of function from about day two to day 12, just by increasing these transcription factors alone. And of course, when you increase these transcription factors, you also dramatically enhance longevity. So these transcription factors are fascinating because they form this stress response network. The heat shock response, of course, is regulated by HSF1. It controls the expression of molecular chaperones. Likewise, the DAF2, age one that I showed you earlier, upstream of DAF16 or FOXO, and these are all regulated by the deacetylase SIRT1. So these cytoplasmic regulators work in close proximity and coordinated with the unfolded protein response in the ER, the mitochondrial unfolded protein response, and the oxidative stress response. So these five transcription factors really are the guardians of protein quality control. So they ensure proteome stability, promote stress resilience, and enhance lifespan and longevity. So this led John Labadia to do an experiment to ask when exactly does proteostasis decline? You'll remember that Anat Benz-V had looked at day one and day four. So John then started to look in more detail and discovered actually the heat shock response in aging declines between day one and day two, measured by the loss of inducibility of heat shock genes. And I think you can see this quite nicely at a whole animal level where these animals have 
a heat shock promoter YFP reporter. And you can see that you compare control to heat shock on day one to day two, it's dramatically reduced. And by Western blot, you can see the reduction in the synthesis and accumulation of the HSP-16 small heat shock chaperone. Well, John decided to look more carefully at this day one, day two, day three transition, and he discovered an abrupt decline by now taking animals precisely synchronized and taking them at four, every four hours through 20 hours of adulthood. And you can see that the inducibility of these three different HSP-70 genes is 100% up through eight hours of adulthood, and then declines by 60 to 70% between eight and 12 hours and stays low. What's interesting is that this loss of the heat shock response coincides with a loss of thermal tolerance. In other words, animals with a robust heat shock response for an eight hours can survive a hot day, 35 degrees centigrade, whereas at 12 hours of adulthood, just in that four hour window, there's a 80% loss in stress survivability. Now this coincides, this window coincides precisely with the onset of reproduction because over this next 12 hours, the animals will make the majority of the progeny. So this suggests something very interesting that the animal is highly protected to make the oocytes and the sperm. Once fertilization occurs and the eggs are laid, a signal must be sent to actually prevent the organism from living longer. Mechanistically, we did a whole series of experiments, and this is summarized here, that in a young adult, the chromatin is open and accessible, allowing the binding of the stress-induced transcription factor HSF1. And this is maintained by high levels of the Jumanji demethylase. The consequence is you get high levels of HSP-70 and small heat shock proteins. We propose that at eight hours, there's a time genetic signal. And we then show that that time genetic signal is due to a loss of this Jumanji demethylase. And what we discover, there's a corresponding change in the chromatin. And now the H3, histone H3 has H3K27 trimethyl, which of course is the repressor leading to the condensation of chromatin. The consequence is HSF cannot bind in vivo and the heat shock response is declined uh, five to 10 fold and there's no more synthesis of chaperones. So this I think provides a mechanistic understanding for the first time of why in aging we have failure in quality control. That the genetic switch, the heat shock transcription system is simply unavailable to activate molecular chaperones. So this led, um, this led uh, uh, John to then ask a simple question. What happens if he overexpresses the Jumanji? So this shows you the increase in the H3K27 trimethyl uh, at the promoters, and this shows you the decrease in the demethylase. So only one of four demethylases go down, goes down. So what John did was, uh, showing you day one in black, day two and day three, this is uh, stress resilience. You can see that wild type animals have this dramatic decline. So he made two lines where he overexpressed just the Jumanji demethylase by 50%. And you can see it has a dramatic protective mm -hmm. effect. But then he then made uh, mutations in the uh, demethylase where it's now missing the nuclear localization signal. And so it retains in the cytoplasm. And you can say in these two different lines that now have the same level of Jumanji, but in the wrong compartment, there's no protection that's occurring. As to where the signal is coming from, one of the beauties of C. elegans is that you can, of course, take advantage of genetics. So you can compare wild type animals between day one and day two. So that's the decline of the heat shock response and therefore no chaperones. If you make animals that are deficient in oocytes, there's no problem. If you make them deficient in sperm or gonad. So that told us that these three tissues are not involved. But then he did a genetic experiment in which there are no germline stem cells. And so this was fascinating because you can see again in the white, this is the decline of the heat shock response. And in black and dark gray, it, you can see what happens uh, if you now 
look at the inducibility of either HSB 70 or HSB 16 between day one and day four, there's absolutely no decline. So this tells us something very exciting, that the germline is what controls the heat shock response. Moreover, the germline regulates the Jumanji directly. So here shows you the levels of Jumanji, which declines. And now if we get rid of the germline stem cells, the levels of the Jumanji demethylase are retained. So I think what this tells us is mechanistically that aging is programmed and it's controlled at the level of chromatin. But most interesting, the signal from germline stem cells can be reset by restoring the levels of the demethylase. Thus, cellular health span, stress resilience, enhanced proteostasis, and lifespan are all linked together genetically. And we propose that this offers then uh, a satisfying explanation for why in aging there are all of these protein misfolding diseases. So this idea, I think, is really interesting in that it suggests that the system is set up beautifully where you have a very strong stress resilience and the ability to activate chaperones. A single signal from the germline stem cells then leads to an epigenetic switch. Uh, the polycomb repressive complex now prevents heat shock factor from binding. What, what makes this interesting is that these animals, as I pointed out, live 20 to 30 days. And yet this event is happening at hours of adulthood between day one and day two, which leads us to suggest the possibility that all of the subsequent failure associated with aging could be ascribed to a imbalance in proteostasis that's initiated at the point of reproductive maturity. Just to sort of end this story, it's not just C. elegans. This is showing you in human cells, this human brains. We examined the expression of 300 chaperones. And in green, they all decline in aging. So these are individuals from 20 years to 99 years. And, and so this is really quite frightening because it means that in normal aging, the molecular chaperones essential for folding all decline. And we did a whole series of genetic experiments and identified that out of the 100 chaperones that decline, there are 21 that also decline in Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, and are genetically important in models of HD um, and uh, A-beta. So what I've told you about today is the critical role of stress responses, chaperones, the quality control machinery and proteostasis, that there's a genetic switch that shuts it off, and our hope that it is possible to reset this system. In other words, that you just delay the onset of molecular failure. Just to thank many people from my laboratory shown here, I talked about them as I described the work. Wonderful colleagues around the world that I collaborate with, uh, it's a great pleasure, and sources of funding. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your lecture, Professor. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, so the first one that came in was, within the aggregate, you can also find RNA, which is sensed as a viral infection. It, even though C. elegans has a very primitive immune system, did you still find some immune genes? That's a very exciting question. And it turns out that the innate immunity system in C. elegans communicates proteostasis quality control between tissues. We have not done proteomics of the extracellular material to ask your question of whether it's possible that these are combinations of signaling molecules of both proteins and RNA. So that'd be a very exciting question. Since as you probably know, microRNAs and non-coding RNAs were actually all discovered in C. elegans. So I think there's a very interesting provocative role for small RNAs. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we have time for another one. Um, would you be able to speculate from an evolutionary standpoint why this switch is integrated in our genome? That's uh, a billion dollar question. <laughs> um, so let me first offer that what I described to you is, is really quite remarkable and it tells us exactly how C. elegans through aging 
regulates proteostasis. And that this switch we propose is absolutely relevant to how we should think about age associated disease. We have not demonstrated that this is what happens in humans. But keep in mind that the period of fecundity in C. elegans is on the order of 60 hours in a lifespan of as much as 30 days. Humans, the period of life of fecundity is much longer, perhaps even half of our, life, of our lifespan. Now, all of the components that we identified genetically, the demethylase, JMJD 3.1, is the ortholog of human Jumanji. H3K27 trimethyl is conserved in all eukaryotes. And of course, the heat shock response, HSF and chaperones are absolutely conserved. So we're testing this idea that aspects of this are functionally relevant in humans, but it may occur over a longer period of time. Perhaps more interesting is what if it, in that longer period of time, that there's hypervariability, that in some individuals, proteostasis and quality control fails at one earlier stage, and in some individuals, it fails at a much different stage. And so that's something that we're testing now. Let me just finally answer your question about the evolutionary aspect. C. elegans is a free living organism, much like fish, much like frogs, much like turtles, much like most of life on earth. And so it really does make sense that the animal, when it generates the next generation, sends a signal to the parent thanking them very much, but shutting off all cell protective mechanisms so that the adult animal does no, no longer survives in the environment. It prevents competition of limited resources, right? This is called the disposable soma theory of aging. Well, I guess that's one way of looking at it. Um... And another question that came in was, so, okay, so as we said, none of this has been yet fully established in humans, at least. Um, but if we could restart the heat shock response or other chaperone transcription factors uh, for chaperones in old age in people, presumably, would there be downsides, perhaps increased cancer risk or something? Similar. This, this is always the case and always the concern, right, is Unlike a simple case that you give three pills and come back in a year, I think this would require a much more precise assessment of your cellular proteostasis state. Too much chaperones is not good, right? You'll, we'll all remember that as children and teenagers, right? <laughs> your parents and your grandparents always went out with you every time you were a teenager, you'd be miserable. So likewise, too many chaperones are not going to be good for the cell and the tissue. And in fact, the point about cancer is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan Lindquist and I had many discussions that, yes, Rick, you want more chaperones for the brain, but more mm -hmm. chaperones for other tissues will cause then oncogenes and all these aberrant mutations to fold improperly. And she's correct. And so the question is, what's the right level that is sufficient to restore the system. And the advantage of discovering a genetic switch, and that's why I'm thrilled that it's not some random event, it's a genetic switch, is that if there's a switch, you turn it back on. And at least with C. elegans, it was as simple as increasing the level of the demethylase by 50%, and there was no negative effect other than the animals lived longer. So, whether, now of course, we have to test these ideas or somebody needs, to test these, somebody needs to test these <laughs> ideas in other systems. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you very, very much for a wonderful lecture and for being able to have the discussion. Uh, I think we are just on time. And if we receive any more questions for you in the next few minutes, I'll forward them to you via email. To thank you, Lana. Answer. And thanks to all of you who participated. I only wish, as I told Lana, that I wasn't there to enjoy your beautiful country. Bye. Bye. Well, hopefully next time.
so um, Professor Kovac, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, our next speaker is Gabor Kovac, who is a professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology at the University of Toronto, a consultant neuropathologist at the University Health Network, and a principal investigator at the TAMS Center, Center sorry, for Research in Neurodegenerative Disease. And his talk will encompass a neuropathology-based approach to tau-related conditions and highlight the current hot topics in the field. Professor, the stage is yours. Dear Lana, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope that everybody here senses. So in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I will summarize uh, our current knowledge on tau-related diseases especially how a neuropathologist and how researchers uh, are currently approaching the classification and characterization of these conditions. So the objectives of the presentation is to position first uh, tau in the group of uh, protein misfolding diseases, then uh, how we characterize tau protein related uh, conditions. I would like to give a novel approach to classification of these conditions, and then uh, highlight uh, major tau protein related conditions, comments on uh, other types, and then summarize the, the lecture. So protein misfolding diseases have relatively similar um, uh, basic uh, concepts. And now I show this here for, for uh, tau protein. So, there is a conformational change, which we don't know how it exactly happens. It can be also due to a mutation in the encoding gene or other uh, reasons for that, uh, leading to uh, distinct folds of uh, filaments, which can be analyzed with uh, uh, cryo-EM. And these different folds of tau filaments lead to cell-to-cell -cell propagation but in a distinctive manner and involving then uh, distinct uh, functional systems of uh, brain regions showing a sequential involvement. The same filaments are able to self-propagate, which we might call as seeding. And this can be monitored by, for example, RT-quick methods, which can then eventually be used uh, in the future in uh, in vivo diagnostics. And these different filaments seem to show different propagation patterns, which could be theoretically translated to the terminology strains, which is now used in misfolding diseases, but originally defined pretty strictly in prion disease research. And as a neuropathologist, these distinct form of filaments lead to distinct fib fibrillar structures that we see in the microscope. And these can be seen with classical methods like hematoxylinosine or silver staining. But we use uh, antibodies and immunohistochemistry because there are a lot of post-translational modifications which can also underlie the different subtypes of disease. So it is better to use this uh, immunohistochemical approach to characterize tau diseases. Just the very basics about the tau protein. So there are six isoforms of tau generated in the human central nervous system by alternative splicing of the mapped gene. And the alternative splicing leads to uh, different isoforms. And in the normal tau, there are three uh, which have four repeats and three which have three repeats. So then we call these three R abbreviated or four R isoforms. In addition, there is a wide range of post-translational modification and it is just starting to be evaluated systematically in different diseases. So we, we don't really know exactly the different patterns linked to different clinical or neuropathological phenotypes. So in summary, when describing or characterizing tau-related conditions, the major concepts should be that uh, tau isoform varies between diseases. The structure and the fold of filamentous tau varies. 
There is uh, experimental evidence for intracellular tau spreading, although the form of the tau protein uh, is not, not yet identified, which is really the one which is inducing or keeping up this tau spreading. The propagation of pathological changes related to tau is accompanied by the suggestion of stages and phases, which we use in the neuropathological evaluation, and as concept can be used to define preclinical or pre symptomatic if we would be able to detect as in vivo before the patients show symptoms. And uh, the next one is that the pathological process of intracellular ordered protein assembly undergoes a kind of a maturation from pre-aggregates detectable by immunohistochemistry with a specific uh, posterization and modification related antibodies, leading then to uh, ubiquitination and uh, fibrillar uh, structures, which are also detected by classical silver staining. And finally, never forget that tau immunoactive cellular inclusions can be the leading pathology, but it can be also coexisting with other neurodegenerative proteinopathies. And this is an image which shows the, what type of tau immunoactivities we yield, really use to characterize in a neuropathological sense the diseases. So there are neuronal tau immunoactivities at least six types like neuro fibrillar tangles, pretangles, pig bodies, grains, which are in dendrites, dystrophic neurites, threads, which are in axons. As you see, astrocytic uh, tau pathology is also shows a wide spectrum. And also oligodendroglia can show different uh, morphological forms, like from thin coiled bodies to large inclusions called globular oligodendroglial inclusions. And here is an image what I, I mentioned already, that kind of maturation intracellular. And this was first described for neurons. So there are some little dots in the nerve cells, which uh, when the tau becomes high phosphorylated and detectable then with phosphospecific antibodies, then this becomes misfolded and detectable by conformation specific antibodies. And then the tau aggregates into major fibrillar structures. And then you can see it with beta sheet binding dyes or further antibodies. And this is just an image in the bottom showing on the right silver staining. And recently we discussed this uh, similar mechanism for the development of astrocytic uh, tau pathologies, which seem to start with these very little dots in the astrocytic processes. And that you can see in, in, uh, in the brains of different uh, tau diseases. And then these develop to this fibrillar uh, structures then which, which are called by different names. Now let me jump to the next uh, topic, which is the classification. And this is a classical approach to classification of tau diseases. And the major groups are three repeat tau pathies, four repeat tau pathies, and mixed like 3R and 4R. And these are the major names of uh, diseases like Pick's disease as a major 3R tau pathy, 4R is progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, cortico basal degeneration, CBD, globular glial tau pathy, GGT, and argyrophilic grain disease, AGD, while the mixed is part, which is primary age-related tau pathy, and this is the Alzheimer variant of uh, tau where you don't find amyloid beta. However, uh, there's a thousands of publications nearly every day describing new tau pathies and here and there and this and that condition. So the, the, the best approach to this is to kind of make an order in the terminology. And this would begin what we call really tauopathy and what we call tau pathology and what we call tau immune activity. So everybody uses a wide range of different antibodies. So we propose that the best is to really describe which antibody they use, and then describe the tau immune reactivity in, in the brain regions. And then if that can be interpreted as a not normal process, so abnormal process, then that region could be described tau pathology, which is a constellation of the tau immune reactivities. And tauopathy is, is used when you describe the constellation of tau pathologies in different regions. And the term tauopathy would be the best to use when you really demonstrate the presence of abundant filamentous tau inclusions, consistent, and this shows a consistent and typical pattern of cellular tau pathologies. Otherwise, every day you can report a novel tauopathy. 
So be careful with that. So based on this, we propose that instead of this uh, uh, 3R, 4R uh, approach, uh, another approach could be considered, which uh, defines uh, uh, five levels. So the first would be those conditions which show tau muta mutations in the tau gene. And then the subclassification would still follow the 3R, 4R and the mix. The next one would be the tauopathies associated with hereditary disorders and extracellular amyloid deposits, which means that these conditions have most likely a different pathogenesis of in inducing the tau uh, pathy. Finally, the third group would be the non-mapped gene mutation associated major tau pathies, and these are what you know generally, like CBD, PSP, and so on. And then the other tau pathies would be where it is consistently reported, but they are not really the, the most uh, frequent and they are kind of geographical clusters or, or we, we don't or associate with some infections or something. And then finally, the fifth group would be where we just describe, there are a lot of describe, descriptions in the literature. So we would be careful to call these at once tauopathies. We don't know how to interpret these, So we would rather use a descriptive terminology and just describe the tau pathology associated with X and X gene alteration or whatever else condition. So following this uh, classification strategy, I would like to show uh, highlights of major uh, diseases. And uh, when you are talking about uh, tau diseases, then these are the major clinical presentations, like the majority is uh, associated with frontotemporal dementia and its subtypes, or movement disorders. And movement disorders are usually a typical Parkinsonism, but can be also levodopa responsive Parkinsonism. And there are rare conditions like uh, posterior cortical atrophy syndrome or or uh, cognitive decline with early urinary incontinence and so on, which are associated with uh, tau diseases. Now, how do we describe a tau pathy? First, we mention, we check what is the isoform predominating. Do we have data on the structure of filaments? Do we have data on seeding, propagation of strain? What type of tau pathology do we see in the microscope? Is there any suggestion for sequential involvement? And what is the uh, uh, spectrum of coexistent pathology? So this is how I usually describe tauopathies. And before jumping into the major conditions, I would like to mention that uh, there is a lot of mutations in the MAPT gene which can lead to tauopathy. And these neuropathologically can resemble the major tauopathies, which I will show you in the next slides. So now I start the part of my lecture where I show you the major tauopathies, and I will use the same strategy which I highlighted two or three slides ago. So this is Pick's disease and the isoform predominant is 3R. The structure of filaments is described like with cryo-EM. There is evidence for seeding capacity using Epiquit, and there is experimental evidence for propagation, and it shows difference than compared to other tauopathy, so the strain property is discussed in this sense. The neuropathology is frontotemporal atrophy with the so-called pig bodies, which are 3R positive, ubiquitinated, and seen with certain types of silver stainings, like here with Bierschowski. There are descriptions of sequential involvement of brain regions. Actually, four phases have been described which suggests that the disease starts in frontotemporal, limbic, uh, uh, and neocortical regions. Coexistent pathologies are rare in Pick's disease, and if it is, then it is mostly AD type, but that correlates with the aging. Importantly, TDP43 pathology is not a feature as coexistent pathology in Pick's disease, which is a very interesting because other topathies usually associate with additional TDP43. Now, let me jump to progressive supranuclear palsy, and this is a 4R tauopathy. The structure of filaments is described. You can find it on BioRVX, still uh, will be published soon. And I will return back in the last slide to this. So there is evidence that the structure of filaments is distinctive, this different than from AD, from PIC or other conditions. 
There is evidence for seeding capacity, so for attic wick, there is evidence for propagation patterns distinguishing that from uh, PSP from other tauopathies, suggesting that this is a different strain. The neuropathology is subcortical, large globose neurofibrillary tangles, uh, astrocytic uh, tau, which is called tufted astrocytes, and oligodendrocytic, which is called coiled bodies. And here I show you a very interesting phenomenon that the different brain regions show different predominance of these cellular tau pathologies. So the left side, you see a cortex with a lot of astrocytic, and on the right, you see the subthalamic nucleus, which is neuronal. And this uh, led to the issue that actually PSP is a very heterogeneous disease clinically, and the movement disorder society defines at least eight subgroups. And neuropathological studies suggest that the tau load in different brain regions contribute to these different clinical phenotypes. So therefore, it is very difficult to develop a staging system for PSP, as you know, like for BRAC stages for Alzheimer's disease or for Lewy body pathology is pretty straightforward. But for PSP, there's a lot of uh, issues which have to be kept in mind, in particular that tau pathology is in different cell types. And here I show our recent uh, paper in, in ACTA Neuropathologica, which shows heat mapping for different clinical phenotypes. And indeed, this confirms that the regional pattern of tau load contributes to the different uh, phenotypes. But in all cases, there are certain vulnerable reg regions which are always affected, which suggests that the disease might start in these regions. And then we did an analysis that uh, whether the different cytopathologies show difference in the clinical phenotypes. And Surprisingly, they do show. So the significant difference between neuronal astrocytic or oligodendrocytic between the different uh, clinical phenotypes. And uh, although the tau load, total tau load, which includes all types of tau pathologies, show a, a brainstem to, to frontal lobe motocortex temporal uh, lobe and finally occipital lobe uh, propagation. When we analyze the cellular tau pathologies, then we see a different pattern for neuronal, for astrocytic and for oligodendrocytic, which means that the neuronal, for example, seems to start in the globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra, then propagate towards the brainstem uh, basal ganglia, while the astrocytic seems to start first in the striatum and then propagate toward the cortex and less dynamically, let's say, towards the, the lower brainstem uh, areas. And the oligodendrocytic is again different. It is usually seem to follow the neuronal uh, propagation. Based on this, we propose the staging system for, for PSV, which I will not go into detail, but at least we propose a neuropathological staging system like six stages, which would be a little bit analogously to the well-known BRAC stages of uh, NFT or Lewy bodies. And a study from Cambridge uh, University UK confirmed that this staging is reproducible in an independent cohort and independent team of researchers. And they also show that it indeed correlates with the antemortem data, including the PSP rating skill and the cognitive examination scale. Finally, uh, PSP uh, is not one disease, as I just tried to highlight. And indeed, experimental data also suggests a wide range of uh, uh, subtypes of PSP on an experimental level also, which would suggest that really there are uh, different strains of PSP. Uh, PSP shows frequently coexistent pathology, and this is mostly uh, AD type, again, correlating with aging, but it also has uh, Lewy body pathology and uh, also TDP43, although not so frequent, like TDP43 is under 10% of the cases and mostly in limbic regions. Now, corticobasal degeneration is another forearm 
tautopathy, the structure of filaments is well described, different from PSB, different from PIG, different from AD. Clear data on attic weak seeding capacity, propagation patterns in experimental models. Neuropathology again is different. The highlight is the astrocytic plaques, where you see a astrocytic nucleus surrounded by a tau accumulation, fibrillar tau accumulation in the distal processes visible by, for example, Hubert. Gaia staining, but also peculiar uh, bodies uh, in, uh, in neurons, which are different than the tangles seen in other conditions. Now, just to be uh, clear, corticobasal degeneration is a neuropathological term and should not be used in a clinical uh, setting. And in a clinical setting, the, the term corticobasal syndrome should be used. By, but corticobasal syndrome can have a lot of uh, other underlying uh, pathological uh, conditions. CBD. Uh, shows about 50% of the cases shows coexistent pathology, a little bit of amyloid beta, a little bit of Lewy body. And interestingly, TDP43 is pretty high in CBD. Some studies even suggest that practically up to 40%, 45% of the CBD cases show TDP43. And in contrast to other conditions where TDP is coexistent, it is not in the limbic system only, but affecting uh, subcortical areas, which would suggest a novel aspect for the TDP43. Uh, globular glial taupathy is a rare condition, uh, harmonized in 2013. And here is a study which shows that it, is, uh, it shows different propagation patterns than other uh, conditions. The neuropathology is pretty clear. There are globular gli os uh, oligodendroglial and globular astroglial conditions. And the subtyping of GGT depends on whether the white matter or the cortical astroglial pathology predominates. This is just an overview from our recent review in JAMA Neurology 2021, where we summarize the worldwide reports and show that practically every type of clinical phenotype can be associated with GGT and even a few mutations in the MAP gene. Copathology is rare in GGT, uh, and uh, this is a little bit reminiscent to the pig's disease that uh, they don't really like other proteinopathies. Agirophilic uh, grain disease is a forar uh, predominant distinct uh, propagation patterns. The pathology is dendritic uh, tau accumulation seen here as dots in the, in the silver staining. Uh, Gajas and Bierschowski, and here in Tau, in the lower panels. There is a staging proposed by Saito et al. 2004, which suggests a sequential involvement. The AGD is, is mostly treated as a coexistent pathology itself and not as a pure disease. So this is an ongoing debate whether there, there is pure forms uh, leading to clinical symptoms exist. Finally, primary age-related tau proteinopathy, which is uh, uh, mixed, and it practically look like, looks like Alzheimer's disease, but there is no amyloid beta. And usually the tau is uh, restricted to the medial temporal lobe because at once, if you see tangles outside the medial temporal lobe, then there is always beta amyloid, which is a kind of a, a border from AD. And, uh, a note on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is an increasingly recognized uh, disorder in, uh, in contact sports. And with mild traumatic uh, brain injury, it seems that it has a distinct tau fall. There is data on seeding capacity and distinctive propagation patterns in experimental model. Neuropathology is uh, depth of the SUTSI, uh, perivascular patchy accumulation of neuronal and astrocytic uh, tau. And it seems that it shows a kind of a staging or a sequential involvement as described by Anne Mackey in 2013. A chronic traumatic encephalopathy associates frequently with other uh, proteinopathies and therefore it is also discussed as a kind of a complex uh, neurodegenerative uh, condition. Before concluding on the uh, presentation, I would like to mention another type of uh, tau disease, which is called aging-related tau astrogliopathy, which have been conceptualized in 2016. And we distinguish uh, 
uh, subpia, subependema, perivascular white matter and gray matter accumulation of tau astrocytes. And uh, uh, in a large cohort of various conditions, these are the regions where you see RTAG and amygdala seems to be a hotspot and the different colors label those regions where you can expect uh, RTAG in different uh, locations. It seems that there is a sequential distribution of RTAG for each of the subtypes. And there is a debate whether it has clinical re relevance, but uh, there are certainly four or five uh, uh, studies in the literature which do show that there is a certain uh, group of uh, patients, mostly elderly, so mostly above 80 or 85, who show clinical symptoms and have a massive amount of astrocytic tau with much less uh, neuronal tau than expected. So this would suggest the concept that uh, ARTAC might have clinical relevance depending on its location and uh, distribution and uh, amount. So finally, the uh, last before the slide is a no, this paper which I cited from BioRVX, which, uh, which is a kind of a complete novel summary of the current uh, concepts which means that if you use cryo-EM, then there is a structure-based uh, approach to classify diseases. And just as you see here, uh, Alzheimer disease part has very similar faults to uh, CT, but CT is still distinctive. So it, it confirms that CT is a distinct entity. Then PIC is a completely different fault. And then the uh, further ones, which we call uh, mostly 4R tauopathies, can be further distinguished as four-layer type, which is CBD, and distinctive is AGD and RTAG, and the three-layer type is PSP, GGT, and a novel form which uh, was described two or three years ago. So this shows that the structure of the filaments indeed allow us to define distinct major tauopathy entities and define subtypes of those. So the summary of the uh, presentation is that the fold of tau filament is different in distinct major tauopathies and thought to be a driving force of different morphologies and patterns seen in the microscope and the strain-like properties recognized in experimental models Hierarchical involvement in the brain, human brain can be recognized. This leads to the staging of neuropathology. Glial tau accumulation is a critical and crucial aspect of taupathies. For RTAG, the important is where it is located, whether it then we can discuss whether it has clinical relevance or not. And evaluating tau pathology in a wide range of disorders is still needed to understand the pathogenesis. Thank you very much. I finished the presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we have a few questions, but I think we'll only have time for one and I'll send you the rest to answer in written form, please. Um, so the question is, with the recent advancement of tau PET imaging, would the neuropathology staging your team proposed be also seen with tau PET in vivo? And has this already been tested? Uh, I hope that it will confirm our, our findings. The tau pet is still needs to be uh, uh, crystallized so to, to clarify what it exactly shows, like uh, whether it is 4R specific or it will recognize also additional Alzheimer type of uh, tangle pathology. Uh, at this moment, there is no PET study, which is a large amount of patients and showing staging, but there are already PET uh, substances which can be used for tau. And I just repeat that the question is how specific they will be for PSP tau or other tau. Okay. And maybe there's time for one more. Um, what might be a plausible explanation between the different cellular distribution and regional propagation for tau pathology in the same disease? Yeah. So I think that uh, my concept is that uh, the, the PSP, we are talking about PSP, for example, that it starts in a same early vulnerable region. And then depending on the micro circuitry of that little region, so even the subthalamic nucleus has 
different circuitries with the brain regions, then the tau starts to propagate. And then depending on where it starts to propagate, the local cell population then will show a different uh, cytopathological accumulation. So if the subthalamic nucleus leads to a frontal variant of PSP, then uh, the cytopathology oligodendrocytic or astrocytic will be less in the subcortical and will be more in the cortical and so on. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your lecture and your time. We'll be in touch via email. And now I think we need to move on to the next lecture. Thank so. you. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Boris Rogel, who is department head at Jozef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana and a professor at the Department of Biochemistry at the Faculty for Chemistry and Chemical Technology in, of Ljubljana's University. And he will present an overview of TDP 43 related pathologies. Please go ahead, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, do you see me? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, it is a great honor to be uh, uh, presenting here, to uh, be carrying the banner for uh, our country as well in, uh, in this uh, educational uh, workshop. So I will uh, talk to you about uh, uh, TDP43 uh, proteinopathies. And uh, the lecture will first focus on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia, where TDP43 proteinopathies are uh, most prominent. We will talk a bit about these disease characteristics, symptoms, epidemiology, and also why quite often we uh, combine these two. So we say ALS and FTD, and it's because there is uh, quite a lot of uh, similarity between the diseases. Professor, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but could you share your presentation? because all we see is the generic slide right now. I am, okay. Aha, uh -huh. this is, oh, so this, okay. So this is the first slide of your presentation, probably. Sorry, it says lecture overview. Um, just a second, please. No, it's still the first slide. So this is not my slide, if that's what you're seeing. Okay. Hi, Professor. Uh, let's try again with uh, the green share screen button. Sorry, let me share screen. Okay, and now the second screen. Okay, wait, yes. Second screen. And share. Share. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. great. Yes. Uh, wait. No, I lost the, no, this doesn't work because I can't regulate this, no. Okay, here, yeah. Um, so so um, then I will talk to you a little bit about uh, the pathology of ALS and FTD, and uh, I will focus on the uh, major protein here uh, in genetic and functional research, which is TDP43. Uh, we also work on a similar gene uh, fused in sarcoma and another important gene in um, uh, which is uh, really important for TDP43 proteinopathies is uh, C9 ORF72. Uh, with the mutation of this gene is uh, uh, extremely interesting, challenging. Uh, would take uh, a lot longer than the half an hour given to uh, present uh, uh, the, um, um, the knowledge on this uh, uh, protein or this mutation. So what is uh, ALS? Um, ALS is also known as motor neuron disease, Lou Gehrig disease, and so on. It is a progressive muscle wasting disease because of the generation of uh, motor neurons in the motor cortex and in the spinal cord. It's a progressive disease because uh, uh, people become progressively paralyzed. Uh, they're unable to walk, talk, uh, feed and toilet themselves. And uh, from the region of onset, it spreads to uh, other uh, regions. Uh, people uh, die 
uh, because they are um, unable to uh, uh, breathe, so the diaphragm starts stops functioning, and uh, death occurs usually around 20 months after the diagnosis. And uh, most importantly, there is no effective treatment for the disease. So in terms of the uh, epidemiology, uh, the mean age of onset is the, in the mid-50s. It is uh, mainly a sporadic disease. There are some uh, 5 to 10% uh, familial uh, with autosomal dominant uh, forms uh, being um, uh, common, most common. Uh, there's slightly more males that get the disease, and uh, it is quite rare, uh, 1 to 2.5 in uh, 100,000 uh, population. It is, uh, I said it's about uh, 20 months, but actually the actual prognosis is quite uh, difficult to predict. Uh, um, it's getting better with some tests, but uh, about 50% people live this uh, shorter time after diagnosis, but some people can live longer um, and some people can live 20 years or more. Here we have Stephen Hawking who lived uh, uh, most of his life with uh, uh, ALS, but he's really a very... Uh, rare uh, person with the disease who lived that long. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, we have a frontotemporal uh, dementia. It's also known as frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So it's because of the degeneration of the uh, frontal and the temporal uh, lobes. Uh, this leads to deterioration of uh, personality um, and uh, um, uh, cognition, and also similar to ALS, the mean age of onset is in the uh, early uh, 50s. The average life expectancy following the uh, diagnosis is about uh, eight years, and uh, most of the patients die from uh, pneumonia, which is like a secondary uh, complication uh, due to the uh, disease. It is uh, relatively rare form of dementia when compared to Alzheimer's disease. So depending on the type of uh, epidemiological studies, three to 20% of dementias are uh, frontotemporal dementias, uh, but um, it is uh, one of the most common uh, causes uh, of uh, dementia in um, population below uh, 65 uh, years of age. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, if we look at the um, genetic uh, findings, and this is where uh, uh, also the, uh, the connections with the, today's theme also comes in, is that um, uh, one of the connections comes into, uh, into the, today's theme, um, is that um, there are uh, quite a few genes which are connected with, um, whose mutations are connected with uh, ALS. Um, and uh, they can be grouped into uh, three uh, groups. One is protein homeostasis, the other one is uh, RNA binding proteins, and the third group is cytoskeletal proteins. Uh, the size of the circle presents kind of the importance of this mutation or the, the, of, uh, in the disease. Um, and uh, we are working on uh, uh, TDP43, and FUS, as I said, so these were uh, discovered uh, uh, by us uh, in, uh, um, um, uh, about uh, 12 years ago, and also c 9 or 72 which is the most common uh, mutation in ALS and frontotemporal dementia. So this is one of uh, Gabor's uh, 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 pictures or schemes from one of his uh, uh, papers. Uh, this is how uh, basically uh, all or majority of neuro neurodegenerations are proteop proteinopathies, and I just wanted to fit TDP into the scheme of things. So it's uh, a protein that is involved in FTLD, ALS, so similar type of pathology um, is found. So the segregation of TDP43. Um, and then there's uh, several other, about six proteins, uh, which are uh, really important in uh, other neurodegenerations. Uh, <clears throat> so why do neurons uh, degenerate in uh, ALS and FTD? As we said, it's TDP43. So 97% of ALS cases, uh, there is cytoplasmic accumulation of TDP43 in motor neurons. TDP43 is usually a nuclear protein. 
and it's involved in uh, pro it's involved in RNA regulation. Um, so this is uh, these are motor neurons. Uh, when we look at the uh, um, cortical neurons in frontotemporal dementia, we can also uh, observe, observe um, this um, uh, uh, wrong placement of TDP43, where here the nuclei labeled in blue are empty, and we have these large aggregates in the in the cytoplasm of these. Uh, Cells. So altogether, these uh, uh, these diseases are labeled TDP43 proteinopathies. Uh, there's now uh, indications that also 60% of Alzheimer's have um, a TDP43 uh, pathology. Uh, some other diseases uh, uh, like late, uh, that's 25% of Alzheimer's is a TDP43 pathology, and uh, even some uh, muscle diseases like uh, IB. Uh, enclosure body myositis. So, uh, and to reiterate this, so TDP43 is uh, ag makes aggregates in the cytoplasm and is lost from the nucleus. So the disease is due to the loss from the nucleus or these cytoplasmic um, aggregates. So what are the actual functions of TDP43? Um, it is uh, involved in uh, RNA uh, regulation, so from splicing, transcription, also in uh, uh, regulation of uh, non-coding RNAs like microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs. Uh, then the, this uh, RNAs are uh, can be, I mean, are transported out of the um, nucleus. Uh, the TDP43 can be still bound to it. Uh, it's involved in the stability of the messenger RNAs in the, in the cytoplasm on the translation. Um, also, it is involved in uh, stress granule formation, which is an adaptation to uh, transient stress, and um, also in uh, uh, regulation or transport of uh, RNAs to the distal ends in uh, neurons where along the axons uh, or neurites, the, the uh, these RNA binding proteins like TDP43 carry messenger RNAs to the um, to the synapses where there where uh, local translation uh, can uh, to the synaptic region where the local translation can uh, occur. So um, TDP43 is a 45 kilodalton protein, and uh, what is important here is that it has these RNA binding. Uh, regions and has a nuclear localizing signal, which makes uh, sure that the um, synthesized protein goes into the nucleus from the cytoplasm. There's a putative nuclear export signal. And really important is this uh, glycine rich domain, which is also called, called prion like domain, uh, disordered domain, um, non structured domain, and so on. And uh, in this, inside this domain is also. Uh, this uh, amyloidogenic core region, and um, which is important for uh, TDP43 uh, um, interactions between um, uh, other, I mean, uh, TDP43 interactions, and um, uh, important for aggregations. So uh, another uh, visualization of this. So if this is a disorder score, this alpha helical region um, has uh, quite. Uh, uh, ordered uh, value, and then around it are uh, disordered, uh, unstructured regions. So also then uh, for, uh, well, this is really important for phase separation, which I will go into uh, uh, in the next slides. And um, getting back to the uh, ALS and uh, uh, a lot of the, the majority of the mutations that are known in ALS uh, quite a few numbered here, as you can see, are actually found in this uh, glycine-rich domain. Uh, there are several other mutations in other um, other parts of the protein, but this is the main uh, region that is involved in the disease. Interestingly, um, ALS uh, altogether has about 1% of mutations. The other 96% are actually wild-type TDP43, which aggregates. So there's other reasons why uh, TDP43 um, pathology uh, occurs. 
and uh, about 60%, as we said, of FTD has uh, TDP43 aggregation, but there is uh, practically no mutations associated with that. So uh, if we were live together in, the, in an audience, I would present the slide and ask you um, what this is. Um, basically, uh, this is a start of an explanation of slides uh, um, uh, for phase separation of proteins. And this is uh, olive oil when you put it into the fridge. So olive oil is a mixture of lipids. And we know that uh, uh, then um, when you start cooling it, um, some of the lipid starts falling out and they form these uh, little um, spherical um, um, co coalescent uh, well, yeah, spheres of, of, of different types of uh, lipids. Um, what is also observed is then with some proteins, when you have a solution of the protein and you do some temperature change, uh, similar things start of occurring. So there's the clouding of the solution. You raise the temperature, the uh, solution is uh, clear again. You uh, you uh, you can uh, start uh, changing the temperature and, and again changing the the solubility or the opaqueness of this solution. So making it either uh, fall out or uh, uh, form these uh, phase separating um, situations or actually. Um, uh, fully dissolved uh, protein. So uh, this is something that happens. So basically, in, uh, you can uh, in a in a normal soluble uh, soluble protein environment, we have a mixture of uh, um, uh, well, in, in in vitro experiments, only one type of protein. But in the cell, we can imagine many different uh, proteins. And then upon some changes, uh, what we have is we have uh, these proteins starting to uh, coalesce together into these uh, um, uh, spheres. And we have this, what is called liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. So uh, physiologically, this is really, really important because uh, um, a lot of, uh, besides the normal organelles like uh, nu uh, nucleus, uh, um, mitochondria and so on. In the cells, we have also uh, what are called membraneless organelles. So these are um, kind of uh, dense condensates of uh, proteins and the RNAs, and uh, they are they form these uh, functional uh, units. One of the really prominent ones is uh, nucleolus, but also stress granules, which I mentioned, P bodies involved in the processing of RNAs and so on and so forth. Um, so from the other side of uh, things, uh, these, uh, um, these uh, uh, liquid liquid phase separated uh, uh, structures are also places where uh, these proteins like TDP43 and, and FAS and so on and so forth come really close together. And what can happen is that um, from this uh, demixing uh, formation of these uh, uh, droplets, um, we have uh, further uh, interactions also via these uh, non-structured domains and form forming kind of hydrogel, so uh, more compact structures. And with time, what can happen is actually within these, um, within these hydrogels or straight from these uh, liquid droplets, we can have protein um, aggregation. Uh, RNA is involved here as well. So, uh, TDP43 and other proteins, I mean, they, they bind to RNA and this kind of makes them soluble. But uh, so shorter RNA forms uh, make the soluble uh, forms of uh, TDP43 or stabilize uh, solubility of TDP43, while the long, um, long RNAs, uh, they can be sometimes structural RNAs, they can bring TDPs together and uh, promote phase separation. This can happen in the nucleus, but also out in the cytoplasm. So to recap aggregate formation, we have this uh, uh, formation of liquid droplets. Here, uh, what we have is, uh, um, it's a kind of a nicer picture. So I presented for uh, FUS uh, protein, we have liquid droplets, which are formed. And uh, within time, what happens in these uh, liquid droplets, uh, these, uh, higher order structures start forming, so like uh, fibrils, and uh, they uh, become um, insoluble, like here. So one can imagine then uh, 
normal nerve cell, which uh, over time with uh, maybe increased concentrations of these proteins or uh, in, in certain locations and so on and so forth, uh, can um, lead to formation of uh, first uh, droplets and then within these droplets also non-soluble um, aggregates. Actually, when you measure these aggregation propensity of proteins, um, you uh, can see that a lot of the uh, proteins that are actually uh, uh, associated with neurodegeneration are actually uh, have really high aggregation uh, propensity. And uh, what is also important is that uh, uh, mutations quite often uh, shift the, these aggregation propensities of these proteins even further to uh, so even higher uh, aggregation uh, propensity. So getting uh, back to uh, TDP43, uh, similar uh, type of uh, um, diagram where we have dispersed TDP43 quite often bound to RNAs. We have liquid droplets. Uh, then these liquid droplets can further compact into hydrogels. And out of this, we can have these fibrillar aggregates, which are characteristic of disease. Um, stress, aging, and so on is involved in uh, uh, creating environment which uh, promotes these uh, uh, droplets, hydrogels, and then down the line, also fibril fibrillar aggregates. Um, also mutations. So uh, in TDP43, uh, we have mutations which can disrupt this uh, um, interacting uh, region, and uh, they can change. Uh, they can change the um, propensity of uh, TDP43 to uh, form uh, these um, uh, droplets. Uh, protein droplets. Um, in fact, this is a this is a recent. Uh, 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 publication uh, where um, it is shown that uh, this uh, disruptions of uh, helix, uh, this uh, this interacting region, also really important for the way TDP43 uh, functions. So we said it binds to the RNAs, and uh, part of the um, part of the binding is uh, um, that um, TDP43 uh, proteins bound to the uh, to the region. Uh, where a uh, recognized regional RNA helps uh, adjacent TDP43 to further bind uh, to, um, to, the, uh, to the RNA. So what you can have is this uh, um, conserved region, this alpha helicon region, dependent binding uh, to uh, RNA. And uh, this is uh, uh, better uh, performed with wild type uh, in comparison to um, disease related, some of the disease related mutants and some of the uh, uh, deletions that uh, these uh, researchers have done. And this is uh, involved in the RNA uh, uh, processing, but also in the processing of uh, three prime UTR. Uh, this is also depending on the on the type of sequences that it binds to. So in some sequences promote this uh, uh, creation of these uh, um, uh, phase uh, uh, transited uh, dro small droplets, some uh, do not. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, this gives us some ideas what can be done about these uh, um, pro or some approaches to uh, remove uh, uh, aggregates. Uh, TDP43 is, uh, uh, and a lot of the RNA binding proteins, I said, are nuclear proteins. So they need some mechanism to go into the nucleus. And another, another a, a type of proteins which are transporters for TDP43 and other RNA binding proteins into the nucleus can also keep TDP43 and uh, similar proteins soluble. So these are carrier beta family members. So either um, adding these pr uh, proteins uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, environment in the cell or uh, enhancing their activity, uh, we can uh, uh, perhaps uh, solubilize these uh, uh, aggregates or prevent them from formation. Uh, so with this kind of uh, uh, nuclear transport factors, we come to another part of the talk, uh, which, we, uh, which we looked at the nuclear 
a transport factor. So this was looking at what makes wild type DDP43 uh, accumulate in the cytoplasm. And the idea we had some time ago was to look at the nuclear transport factors. We did a screening where we knocked down uh, um, the transport factors individually, and we looked at cells where TDP43 was in the cytoplasm. Here's a control, TDP43 green is in the nucleus. And if you look at these uh, uh, successful knockdowns uh, and uh, misplacements of TDP43, you see TDP43 in the, in the cytoplasm. So five proteins really came out. Uh, NUP62, NUP54, and L1 are part of the this called uh, NUP62 subcomplex, the nuclear pore complex. Uh, and uh, these, it's obvious when these don't function, nuclear pores don't function. So there's no import of TDP43 into the nucleus. But these, Caraferin beta 1 and CAS, are really important because they're part of this uh, classical or Caraferin beta nuclear import and led us to analyze uh, these, uh, the, uh, these proteins in, um, um, uh, uh, to try and associate them with the disease. And uh, what was really, really interesting was that uh, when we looked at the um, FTD, um, in when we looked at CAS in the FTD, we saw almost a disappearance of expression of CAS. Here's the Western blot showing this, and this uh, lane uh, four, uh, which is among the um, um, patient post-mortem samples was actually shown to be uh, misdiagnosis uh, later on uh, uh, in some other studies. So there's really a loss of CAS in these uh, samples. Um, so what does nuclear import uh, look like? As there's an educational workshop, I made this little uh, cartoon. So if TDP43 is a cargo, then we have caraferin alphas, which, uh, which are a trailer, and caraferin betas, which are the trucks. So we have the nuclear pore. Uh, we have TDP43 in the cytoplasm that binds to the, the, that is put on a trailer. And then caraferin beta uh, recognizes the, the, this and takes it into the nucleus. In the nucleus, what we have, we have TDP43. So this transport uh, uh, is uh, disrupted. So TDP43 remains in the nucleus. Alpha and beta separate out. Beta goes out by itself. And we need another protein called, uh, so which I mentioned, CAS, to start uh, to import alpha out. So then alpha is out of the uh, nucleus in the cytoplasm, and it can repeat this, uh, this import. So if we have lack of CAS, lack of beta, we have misaccumulation of uh, alpha and uh, TDP43. In fact, uh, any change in the amount or localization of uh, uh, nuclear transport factors may uh, cause uh, cytoplasmic accumulation of TDP43. So uh, going into um, fly experiments uh, um, in collaboration with the uh, King's College London, um, we have uh, shown that uh, uh, in flies, um, uh, the analog of caraferin alpha-4 um, actually binds to the analog of TDP-43 in flies. And uh, then, um, Going further into uh, postmortem tissues of humans, uh, what we saw is that actually in TDP in, in uh, situations where with TDP43 proteinopathies, like, such as FTD TDP or C9 uh, associated uh, um, uh, FTD, uh, we have uh, increase or actually almost uh, complete change in localization of caraferin alpha from the sort of uh, predominantly nuclear, but a little bit cytoplasmic uh, expression to predominantly cytoplasmic expression. Um, we also have this, uh, this has also been shown by um, a group of uh, Don uh, Cleveland, uh, where um, the, this is just a cartoon from uh, the, the paper, um, where they show that in the healthy neuron, we have TDP43 uh, in normally in the nucleus, uh, forming these small liquid droplets. Um, then in the then with some stress and so on, it can accumulate in the in the cytoplasm. And uh, then uh, 
with prolonged stress or aging, uh, TDP43 can also be phosphorylated. It can bind to important alpha. Important alphas are caraferin alphas. So it's another uh, name for them. And NUP62, which we uh, mentioned as well uh, before. And uh, these form these kind of uh, droplets uh, in, in, the, in the cytoplasm and with further stress and, further, and aging and changes in the, in, the, in the neuron, we have formation of solid aggregates, some other transport factors also, nuclear transport factors aggregate, and uh, this leads to uh, cell death. So I'm, I'm coming back to the slide because it's the penultimate slide. So uh, just to reiterate this, there's nuclear and lo loss of nuclear TDP, and cytoplasmic accumulation. So the other important uh, thing uh, to, to another important mechanism to mention here is autoregulation of TDP43, which can all, which kind of also brings in a spanner into the works here. And um, so we have TDP43. Uh, uh, this is the messenger RNA, and uh, on this messenger RNA, there is a region that uh, on the on the RNA that uh, is bound by TDP43. And uh, when we have um, abundance of uh, TDP43, there is uh, autoregulation and uh, there is uh, destruction via two possible or degradation by two possible mechanisms, which I will not go into of the messenger RNA. So it kind of, if there's enough TDP43, it's a, the cells kind of have a mechanism to say, don't produce anymore. If there isn't uh, enough, so it, it can continue uh, producing and producing and producing. And what we see in the, in the disease is that actually there isn't any TDP43 in the nucleus, although there's a lot of TDP43 in the cell, but it's all kind of in the aggregate. So I will, I will stop here and uh, just present colleagues and funding. Uh, a lot of long time of work here uh, um, has, uh, uh, has elapsed uh, also, uh, international collaborators and our work now is mainly funded by Slovenian research agencies, but also from some other funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we are very short on time, so I'll only ask you one question and forward you the rest by email for you to please answer okay. in writing. Um, the first question we've received are, are there any clues that this disease, presumably ALS, could be triggered by viral infections, such as, for example, SARS-CoV-2? For SARS-CoV-2 is really, really early days. Uh, there are ideas about this. So it's, there are clues. Uh, there are uh, some uh, ideas that uh, even endogenous viruses, uh, like HERV um, viruses, can actually trigger the uh, disease. So they trigger cellular stress, and cellular stress then triggers these uh, mislocalizations of TDP43, so yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you. And uh, now um, our next presenter will actually not be a presenter, it will be a video because Professor Bundin could not make it live. So there will not be a discussion at the end of the video either but you are all very welcome to still send in questions that will reach him and then he will have an opportunity to answer in written form. So Professor Patrick Brundin is the Deputy Chief Scientific Officer and the Director of Parkinson's Disease Center in the, de in the Department of Neurodegenerative Science at the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in his talk, he will review the current knowledge about the different processes that contribute to the development of Parkinson's disease and potential therapy avenues to slow disease progression. So let's roll the tape, please. Thank you so much for inviting me. During the next few minutes, I'd like to tell you how I think one can crack Parkinson's disease. The themes for today are just a brief introduction of Parkinson's disease, followed by a very brief overview of what might be underlying pathogenic mechanisms and what could be initial triggers of the disease. Then I'll actually do a slight excursion into COVID-19 because there might be something we can learn from the pandemic in relation to Parkinson's disease. 
And then I will also do another slight excursion for just for a few minutes to multiple system atrophy, which is a similar disorder. I'd say same, same, but it is still different. And finally, I will finish off with some ideas about therapeutic targets and drug repurposing. So what is Parkinson's disease as a brief introduction? Well, it's a classically a motor disease, which I think most of you know, bradykinesia, rigidity, tremors, walking difficulties. And this primarily we think is loss of dopamine neurons, which underlies these phenomena. So that's the classic neuropathology of Parkinson's disease. But every patient has a series of non-motor symptoms too, which are really troublesome for the patients. And they can include the sense, loss of sense of smell, changes in the gastrointestinal tract, pain, um, a series of psychiatric problems, depression, and anxiety. Now, the causes of these are not so well understood, but we believe that Lewy pathology might contribute to some of these non-motor symptoms. And Lewy pathology is intraneuronal inclusions of aggregated alpha-synuclein. I'm going to come back to this. Now, we have learned that the Lewy pathology isn't just in the substantia nigra, where the dopamine neurons are, the ones that die, but the Lewy pathology is all over the brain and, in fact, progressively spreads as the disease gets worse. So what is the natural history of Parkinson's disease? And this is a rather complicated diagram, but I'd like to introduce it nonetheless, because it shows that to the left here, where there's a white color, uh, that is the period of time that precedes motor symptoms, this period here. And there are still many different symptoms and signs of disease, including loss of sense of smell, constipation, sleep disorder, anxiety, and depression, for example. And at this point, the diagnosis of Parkinson's is made when the classic motor symptoms occur. So then, of course, as time goes by, the symptoms get worse, and there's addition of many other symptoms. What's so interesting about this is that Heiko Brock suggested this funnel could be explained by a, a series of changes in Lewy pathology. He suggested, in fact, that Lewy pathology, uh, these aggregates in neurons, underlie some of the phenomena that occur before motor symptoms appear. And if we look at constipation and hyposmia, uh, he suggested that constipation and hyposmia occur at the very earliest stages of Lewy pathology. Brock and his colleagues divided Lewy pathology into six stages that he suggested progressively involve the brain. The second stage would be involving the locus cerulis in the brainstem, which would coincide with sleep disorder and depression. And not until stage three or four are the substantia nigra dopamine neurons engaged. And that is when one gets the motor symptoms occurring. And then if you look at the brain on the right, you can see that the Lewy pathology is all over the brain eventually. And Heiko Brock suggested that this spread of Lewy pathology was potentially following axonal pathways. And what was causing it? Well, let me return to that. Because if we look at theories about underlying pathogenic mechanisms in Parkinson's, one of the mechanisms I will mention is related to this spreading phenomenon. I could argue that there are three major pathogenic features in Parkinson's disease. Inflammation, which previously was considered a consequence, might be a causative phenomenon. So the microglia here that are the blue cells that get excited with a red inflammatory response, they release cytokines that could affect the neurons nearby and actually participate in the killing. Loss of energy production due to mitochondrial failure certainly occurs in some rare genetic forms of Parkinson's disease and may contribute also to the common sporadic forms and kill neurons that fail to produce enough energy and instead produce free radicals in the mitochondria. The third mechanism is related to this Lewy pathology or the alpha synuclein aggregates. The idea here is that these form for some reason, and we could discuss this for hours, but when the synuclein aggregates, 
they form inside neurons, these aggregates, and the idea is that they can then move and propagate between cells. So one cell will have aggregates in the beginning, second cell that has contact with that cell will, in a prion-like fashion, develop aggregates. Our group and, uh, and uh, some colleagues in Chicago, headed by Jeff Cordova, suggested in 2008, based on some findings in neural transplants, that this phenomenon of misfolded synuclein moving from one cell to another could actually occur in Parkinson's disease. We were seeing Lewy bodies in very immature, young, transplanted cells that surely couldn't have the disease unless it had been induced by something in the patient's brain. So we suggested that uh, alpha-synuclein was the spreading agent and that alpha-synuclein released from the host brain could enter the transplanted cells and form Lewy bodies. And we suggested that this was what would explain what had been suggested by Brock uh, to be the progression of Lewy pathology through different stages. But let's look at this prodrome that I mentioned uh, just a while back. So let's return to this phenomenon here and ask, what is this prodrome and why is it important? Well, I think it's important because hyposmia is very common and this can occur five to 20 years before the diagnosis of Parkinson's and constipation is also very com common, albeit rather nonspecific because it occurs in many conditions. These very common phenomena led us to suggest, and others to suggest uh, about 10 years ago, that the disease might actually start in the gut or in the nose. And then in a prion-like fashion, alpha synuclein aggregates or Lewy bodies would spread around the brain. So a few years ago, we asked, can we create an animal model where the olfactory system is a starting point? And could we trigger this whole process using protein aggregates? So we made protein aggregates in a test tube. We microinjected them into the olfactory bulb of mice. We tried to mimic what Heiko Brock had seen in the olfactory system. This is actually Lewy pathology, the brown stuff in that photograph. And we're looking for similar phenomena in the mice. We saw that, but interestingly, when we injected it into the olfactory bulb of mice, not only did we see the pathology in the olfactory bulb or the anterior olfactory nucleus, but over time it spread. It spread so that about 40 brain regions were engaged by 12 months after the injection. And these were on both sides of the brain, and some of the Lewy pathology was even present in the brainstem, in the substantia nigra, locus cerulis, and in the rafa nuclei, so far away from the injection site. We suggested that the pathology was spreading in a prion like fashion. And we observed also a host of other changes summarized in this slide. This top part of the slide is actually a uh, Diagram showing how the pathology spreads over time. The bigger the little bubble, the more pathology. And in this particular paper, we collaborated with Chris Metzias and his supervisor to study uh, mathematical modeling of the spread based on how strong the axonal projections are between different brain regions, how quickly and how much would the pathology spread. And the conclusion of the last 10 years of work is Lewy pathology in this model follows neural tracts, the spread. It depends on the type of aggregates we inject. One can make different types of alpha synuclein aggregates, so get different types of spreading. It perturbs the neuronal activity. Some cells will die in olfactory nuclei, and there are also olfactory deficits. So that's mimicking hyposmia, which we see in the Parkinson program. The next question is, can we create an animal model with a gut as a starting point? And in this case, we chose to use inflammation as the initial trigger, because we know from clinical studies that inflammatory bowel disease is associated with greater risk of Parkinson's disease. And we also know that one of the inflammatory diseases, in this case, Crohn's disease, is associated with increased levels of alpha-synuclein in the gut. So there is a link between these conditions. So we generated in a transgenic synuclein mouse, 
a model of colitis, similar to what's seen in, in inflammatory bowel disease in humans. We gave a compound called dextrin sodium sulfate, DSS for short, and induced a massive inflammation, as you see in the IL-6 peak in the bar diagram. Interestingly, that inflammation caused the alpha-synuclein levels to go up in the wall of the gut. So inside the nerves innervating gut, alpha-synuclein went through the roof and we use different inflammatory paradigms. These animals have pathology in the brain because they're transgenic mice. And we saw no changes in Lewy pathology six months after injecting DSS. So uh, giving drinking water gave the same result as DSS. But when we waited for a year and a half, it was clear that the pathology in the DSS injected animals was much increased. And they'd only received a short period of D uh, DSS early in life. And we could quantify this. So elevated Lewy pathology, 18 months after DSS. And most remarkably, these animals also had lost nigel dopamine neurons. And here are the DSS treated animals 18 months after following them. And here is the clear loss in dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. So quite a remarkable result. We just published this earlier this year, together with a large team from Roche, and it's in the journal Free Neuropathology, which is actually totally free, uh, both for the people who read it and those who publish, which is exciting. So what could start these um, inflammatory states in which alpha sanu can, can trigger? Uh, can, can it miss for what could be the trigger? So we we know a little bit about the where and the how, um, but we don't know too much. It's important to emphasize only about 5% of Parkinson cases are genetic, are familial, maybe less in some countries. So in the remaining cases, 95%, there must be a risk gene landscape. And we suggest that that could maybe interact with pathogens. So what we're saying is that perhaps in these nine and a half patients out of 10, there could be infections in different peripheral organs, in the nose and the gut and the heart and the lung and the liver, or in the urinary system that could then cause alpha synuclein to misfold. And if you look at the brains here, as they turn red, you'll see that it may cause alpha synuclein to misfold and spread with different patterns. And maybe this is related to whether a patient gets dementia or just a more pure motor Parkinson's disease, or whether they actually start with dementia, which is dementia with Lewy bodies. So we've summarized this concept in a speculative article two years ago, where we asked the question, could infections trigger alpha-synucleinopathies? And that's a COVID connection. So there are now at least three cases in the literature of acute Parkinsonism soon after COVID. These were normal people, no inheritance or familial history of Parkinson's, no prodromal signs, no hyposmia before the COVID and no constipation. And they developed Parkinsonism within two to five weeks after severe COVID. And all three of them showed loss of dopamine on brain scans. Two of them responded really well to medication with L-dopa or similar drugs and one recovered spontaneously. I'm just gonna show you one of these patients. It's a, a patient uh, showing, he was 45 years old from Israel, showing the classical signs of Parkinsonism, um, including loss of sense of smell, but acute onset, and improving on pramiprexol, which of course is a dopamine agonist. And on the brain scan, it's clear that there was a loss of dopamine in the stratum. So how do we explain this? Well, we wrote a commentary about this, uh, uh, Vendranath, David Beckham and myself, not the soccer player, but the virologist from Colorado, David Beckham. And we discussed the fact that SARS-CoV-2 gets in through the nose and also can attack the gut, this is known. And we asked the question whether it could be vascular damage in the brain or whether it could be the massive systemic inflammation that damaged neurons in the brain, or whether it could be the direct neuro invasion via, for example, the vagal nerve from innervating the gut or the olfactory system. And we know now from a few post-mortem cases of COVID-19, not those who had Parkinsonism, but just regular COVID-19, 
that there is microglial activation, there's T cell infiltration. And there's some suggestions from unpublished monkey studies that maybe alpha synuclein goes up. We don't know if there's neurodegeneration, but you could imagine then that this is how Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism can occur acutely after COVID-19. But what if it doesn't occur acutely because these are rare cases, right? I'm describing three. Could it be that even if there isn't loss acutely, so the dopamine neurons aren't lost in this diagram, you see there's still, there's still no loss over here, could it be that in the long term, there'll be a chronic neuroinflammation and aggregates of synuclein that over years or decades could cause neurodegeneration? We don't know, of course. We haven't seen any of these people. We don't know if striatal dopamine will be reduced and if the NIGA will die. But perhaps one should be a little bit cautious because we do know that within a, a year or a year and a half, when people have followed individuals uh, cognitively, people who have suffered from COVID-19, one has seen in an Argentine sample that in particular, those who lost their sense of smell due to COVID-19, there is cognitive impairment. So some kind of impact on brain functioning. And these cognitive deficits in people who survive COVID-19 can also occur in people who don't have a, a very severe disease, which of course is a little bit troubling uh, because there are of course millions of people who've had not such severe COVID. So let me now finish off by a couple of brief areas talking about multiple system atrophy, which I would argue is similar to Parkinson's, but different. You probably know it's a synucleinopathy. It's different because the symptoms aren't identical. It's similar because alpha synuclein aggregates, but in this case, inside oligodendrocytes. What's fascinating about MSA is that the prodrome typically includes sexual dysfunction and urinary tract dysfunction. So before the motor symptoms occur. That's a little bit different to Parkinson's where this is not typical. So we set about, about two, three years ago, making a mouse model of MSA where we injected bacteria into the bladder. Uh, we call these uropathogenic E. coli, UPEC for short. And lo and behold, what we saw was that alpha synuclein went up in the wall of the bladder and insoluble aggregated synuclein was present. And we saw that this alpha synuclein coincided with the marker MPO myeloperoxidase, which told us that these could be neutrophil leukocytes. So not neurons. And the increase in myeloperoxidase was very similar to the increase in alpha synuclein when we had different doses of bacteria. And we now know, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the neutrophil leukocytes, when they react to bacteria, they can release alpha synuclein in what's called neutrophil extracellular traps. So these traps actually contain um, a nuclear material and also alpha synuclein. So we set about modeling this in vivo, and this is where we're at now. We've made a mouse that has human synuclein. And then we've overexpressed inside the oligodendrocytes, the ones affected in MSA, alpha synuclein. We've then made fibrils from the brains of the people with MSA in a test tube. And then we've sucked these up into a syringe and injected them into the urinary blood of the mouse. We followed these for nine months. We've looked at motor dysfunction and we've studied the central nervous system looking out for aggregates. And lo and behold, when we inject fibrils in these humanized mice that have oligodendrocyte con uh, that contain synuclein, we get pathology in the red bars in this diagram. And this coincides with an inflammatory response when we stay in for microglia. So we are now concluding that infections can trigger alpha synuclein upregulation and aggregation in this mouse model of MSA, and neutrophils actually express the synuclein. And then we'll have fibers, we can propagate pathology from the periphery in a pattern that's similar to MSA. All right, I have about two, three minutes to go. Let me tell you a little bit about therapeutic targets and drug repurposing. How can we use the knowledge that we collectively as a research field is generating? 
or we are generating well how can we understand how synuclein pathology and neurodegeneration spreads i've suggested to you that maybe reducing inflammation stopping that sticky protein alpha synuclein or restoring mitochondrial metabolism could be drug targets and it's no surprise to you that alpha synuclein has been targeted extensively therapeutically people have tried to reduce its production reduce its aggregation promote its degradation if it has aggregated inside the cell or promote its extracellular degradation. And number five, several scientists have tried to reduce its uptake once it's released from a neuron to another cell. And you probably know that the first of many trials using alpha-synuclein immunotherapy antibodies that target alpha-synuclein actually failed. This was the Biogen trial that was published, uh, a press release in February this year. Well, does this mean that this trial tells us that synuclein isn't a good therapeutic target? I don't think so. And I can refer you to this article, which we have written together, Kill Parkinson's Trust uh, Research Director and Associate Director, myself, where we list all the clinical trial programs in the pipeline that target synuclein. There are many approaches, and they do it in different ways, as I hinted in two slides ago. So I think it's too early to say the Biogen trial failed, but there are many other ways that one might do this. Together with Pure, Pure Parkinson's, we have been repurposing drugs for the past 10 years. And this is a program that was initiated by the late and great Tom Isaacs, a Parkinson's advocate who started the foundation, together with Richard Wise and and I have chaired their scientific committee. What we have done is we've looked at drugs that might be good at slowing um, progression, possibly by inhibiting inflammation or changing mitochondrial metabolism or changing synuclein aggregation. The very first year we met, we, um, we went through 25 compounds. We've done this now 10 times every year. We review these in detail based on their suitability, safety, ability to get into the brain, et cetera. And the first compound we were excited about was an anti-diabetic agent called Bijurin. And the amazing thing is the clinical trial led by Tom Fultony in that picture showed that exenatide or Bijurin treated patients, it's just same name or, or two names for a very similar drug, one is slow release, the other one is more acute. Exenatide treated patients improved. And when at the end of the trial, at the 48-week uh, time point, the drug was removed, they stayed better than placebo-treated individuals. This suggests there was some kind of permanency to the effect. So exciting, Bijurin has now gone into a phase three trial with six centers, two-year follow-up. And our institute is part of sponsoring this, as is the British government and Cure Parkinson's. So we will know in a, a couple of years if this might work. And this is a way perhaps of modulating mitochondrial metabolism through the anti-diabetic agent, but actually exenatide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, does many things. One is actually, it seems to reduce inflammation. Well, what else do we need to crack that Parkinson nut? My very final slide. Well, for our discussion, maybe at some point, I think we need to refine Parkinson's disease. It's not one disease. Every patient is unique. They really have to look at more personalized medicine. The different triggers may attack the nose, the gut sometimes, might mean we get different diseases. And as a result, we may need precision medicine to, to modify progression. And we may need to go in very early before there's motor failure and diagnose and start treatment. There might be certain parts of the path pathogenic process that is in common for most patients, and I would suggest inflammation is such a part. And it might be necessary eventually to combine therapies. Otherwise, perhaps we will never really be able to significantly slow the disease. It'll be minor increments. But I'm somewhat optimistic. I think you might sense that. And I think if we crack this nut, 
Parkinson's disease. Maybe there'll be other nuts in terms of other neurodegenerative diseases that will benefit from that research too. And with that, I want to end and say thank you. So um, here we are again. Uh, our next presenter is Professor Roger Barker, who is a professor of clinical neuroscience and honorary consultant in neurology at the University of Cambridge and at Addenbrooke's Hospital, as well as the principal investigator in the MRC Wellcome Stem Cell Institute of Cambridge and director of the UK Regenerative Medicine Platform in Pluripotent and Engineered Cells. And his lecture will address the latest advances in Huntington's disease research. Please go ahead, Professor. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to try and share my screen. And I hope you can all see that. We can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak. I'm sorry I can't actually be there. It, I'm sure it's much more beautiful there than it is here in Cambridge. So I thought what I would do in this talk on Huntington's disease is walk you a little bit through the background. What is Huntington's disease? What causes it? Uh, some of the pathology. And then at each point, I want to just sort of highlight some of the challenges going forward for those who are thinking about therapeutics and how we can best uh, treat this condition. So uh, George Huntington, who was the person who described this paper, uh, this disease back in 1872, was his one and only paper. So in the current uh, um, research environment, George wouldn't get a, a tenured job anyway because he only had one paper. But nevertheless, he described this critical condition in a series of patients that he had followed uh, with his father and grandfather in a practice in the East Coast of uh, America. And for those who like a bit of history with this, uh, there are uh, very few famous people uh, with Huntington's disease, but Woody Guthrie, the American folk singer, was somebody who did have this condition. His wife set up the Guthrie Foundation, which then led to the Registry Disease Foundation, uh, uh, Foundation, which ultimately transformed, if you like, into CHDI. So this has been a major uh, research enterprise which actually found the gene for Huntington's disease. And Ian McEwen, who's very interested in neurology, one of the main characters in his novel Saturday, has Huntington's disease. But what is Huntington's disease? Well, I'm sure you're all aware of what this is. This is an inherited autosomal dominant condition with full penetrance. If you inherit the abnormal gene, you will develop the disease at some point uh, in your uh, lifetime. That was found in 1993 and the abnormal gene codes for an abnormal Huntington protein. It typically presents in midlife, uh, so 30 to 50. The oldest patient I've seen with new onset Hunter's disease is 86, who had just developed a little bit of career. And the youngest patient I've ever seen is 11, who presented with very marked Parkinsonian features. So it can present at any age, and we're seeing an increasing number of people presenting later in life. From the moment it first presents clinically, patients typically progress over a 20-year period. And in the, to give it some sort of idea of prevalence, you know, in the United Kingdom, there are around five or 6,000 cases of Huntington's disease. There are 130,000 people with Parkinson's disease and there are probably 600,000 people uh, with dementia. So this is a relatively rare disorder, but it has a clear genetic basis, which opens up opportunities for research and for doing studies in people with degenerative disorders at an earlier age than in other conditions. It is not, called Huntington with a D, which is what happens a lot in this part of the country because there's a nearby town called Huntington. And it's not called Huntington's career because the condition isn't just a movement disorder. Now, just to sort of give you a very simplistic view of what this looks like, the abnormal gene, as I say, codes for an abnormal form of the mutant Huntington. And the oligomeric form of that then interferes with various processes inside the cell, which are illustrated in that figure at the top. This includes factors which uh, uh, code for growth factors, but ultimately the production of that abnormal Huntington over time leads to cellular dysfunction, protein aggregation, and ultimately cell death. And offsetting this production of the abnormal protein throughout this uh, lifetime is the removal of that protein through various uh, uh, intracellular pathways, of which one I want to just flag up is autophagy. 
So whilst this is a disease for which a pathway has been proposed, the details still need to be worked out. The relevant contribution of each part is unknown. It's also important to remember that Huntington's disease, whilst it affects neurons and is said to be neurodegenerative, actually does have other players that are important. So inflammation and microglia are important in Huntington's disease, both centrally and peripherally in terms of inflammation. And there's also now an emerging uh, story about how astrocytes are involved in this condition. So this is summarized in this slide, looking at a series of transgenic animals, as well as in uh, IPS derived uh, glial cells from patients with Huntington's disease, where it's been shown that the astrocytes, uh, which obviously contain mutant Huntington, because every cell contains mutant Huntington, actually have abnormalities. And work from Steve Goldman in particular has demonstrated that human astrocytes containing the Huntington mutation can actually derive aspects of the disease. So Huntington's disease, whilst it's neurodegenerative, clearly has an inflammatory component, the contribution of which is unknown, but there is also a glial component, most obviously astrocytes, which obviously has therapeutic implications because when we come to treat this condition, it's obviously important to know which compartment you're gonna treat and whether you're just gonna replace neurons if you're looking down a strategy of transplantation, for example, which I'll talk about at the end, or whether you're gonna to have to use neurons and glia if you're taking that approach. And obviously any therapeutic agent has got to have access to both these compartments in order for it to be truly effective. So that's what goes wrong in Huntington. You produce the mutant Huntington and over time, uh, the normal processes for removing it such as autophagy become overwhelmed or dysfunctional leading to aggregation of the protein, which leads to cellular dysfunction, both in neurons and in glia, as well as an inflammatory component. This then leads with time, as I say, to cellular dysfunction, uh, atrophy of cells and then cell death, of which the classic pathology is this as described by von Stattel, where you have the striatum and the human, you obviously have the chordate and the putamen separated by the internal capsule. And as you progress through this condition, you get progressive collapse of the striatal structure. And this is how it's graded on the von Sattel's uh, system. So that's how it's classically thought of and was thought of as a disease of the striatum, but it's clearly uh, not uh, related solely to that. You can see on this MRI scan of a normal, here's the head of chordate and putamen. You can see on this patient with established uh, Huntsies, there's not only shrinkage of the striatum, but there is shrinkage of the whole brain. And so actually in Huntington's disease, whilst the striatum takes a major early hit in the pathology, it is not the only site. And in this cross-sectional study, uh, cross-sectional uh, um, pathological specimen, you can see, for example, that the temporal lobe is severely atrophied. So hunting disease, whilst it has predilection for affecting the striatum, and this has implications therapeutically, it is not the only site of pathology. Indeed, the pathology is much more widespread. And that widespread pathology probably begins from a very early stage in the disease. So these studies from sort of early part of this century, progressing through to uh, more recent work led by Sarah Tabrizi and the Track HD, has shown that while striatal atrophy is an early feature and progresses in a relatively linear fashion, uh, in the early stages of disease, there is a, a extensive loss in other sites uh, throughout the brain, some of which will become relevant. And I particularly just flag up the hippocampus here, that this is a structure that does have relatively early pathology in transgenic animals and also in patients if you look for it. So this also has therapeutic implications because many people are trying to target therapies specifically to the striatum to repair the problems you see. Whilst that may ameliorate some of the factors, it won't treat all aspects of the disease. This is a widespread CNS disorder, as I say, of which the striatum takes a preferential hit, but not a sole hit. So that's what causes the pathology intracellular from the oligomeric uh, um, Huntington. That's the macroscopic pathology you see. What does this actually look like? Well, obviously this is a disease for which you are born with the gene. So uh, there will be a long period of time when the gene is being uh, expressed, uh, the mutant Huntington is being produced, but there is absolutely no features whatsoever in the patient of this. So this would be pre-manifest. This actually precedes the onset of any features which could be described as the disease state. Uh, and then uh, there is obviously, once things start to emerge, which I'll come on to in a minute, the patient moves into a manifest state. Now, obviously, there's a stage at which the patient presents, as I've just said clinically, there must be a stage at which the disease process begins, although some people would argue the disease process begins from the moment you're conceived because you're producing abnormal Huntington at that point. But there's clearly a time at which the production of that abnormal protein 
leads to dysfunction in cells and things start to go wrong in the brain for which you can compensate for a number of years before it actually starts to become manifest uh, clinically. Now, there are just a couple of concepts I wanted just to get across at this point, which is more for people who are clinically orientated than perhaps people in the labs. But I think it's important to understand that pre-manifest stages of the disease are very attractive therapeutically because this is the point at which you could actually target therapies to stop people developing the disease, assuming you can pick up the earliest stages. And then there's a manifest when people obviously have the condition. Now, clinically in neurology, there are two things to remember. There are symptoms, which is what people complain about, and there are signs of what you find on examination. And this is important because you'll read uh, very many papers where mice are symptomatic or not symptomatic in terms of transgenic mice. All mice are asymptomatic. They cannot tell you that they have any problems at all. So it's a, an incorrect use of the term symptoms. So symptoms are what people tell you, signs are what you find on examination. And in Huntington's disease, some people are very introspective. So they'll tell you lots of symptoms, but the question is, have they got the disease? And patients with established disease have no insight into the condition, so they will have no symptoms at all. So then the question is, when does someone actually have the condition and when do they not? So these are actually quite difficult clinical questions uh, to answer. And it's very challenging to know when people transition from a period of simply carrying the gene to actually having a vert disease, which has major implications uh, for their career and for their future health. Now, obviously, lots of people have tried to look at this. Uh, we've been part of the Predict HD run by uh, Jane Paulson. There's also the Track HD. And there are clearly factors and features which allow you to predict when people are transitioning into early stage disease around subtle motor abnormalities, cognitive deficits, uh, and such like. And you can use imaging to help you with that. So all of this has therapeutic implications because obviously for most people working neurodegenerative disorders, the idea is to treat ahead of them getting overt disease. So prodromal pre-manifest disease offers a very attractive group of patients for this, uh, uh, this therapeutic approach. I next want to walk you through some of the clinical features of Hunter's disease and how your patients can tell you actually what's going wrong and allow you to direct your research to areas which may have passed you by in the past because they haven't classically been associated with it. So the typical features of Huntington's disease are people present with early fidgety movements. They then become rather stiff, rather slow. They have difficulty sustaining movements, keeping their tongue out, moving their eyes in a smooth fashion. Cognitively, they have difficulty planning, organizing, and monitoring their behavior. Often making trivial decisions can be extremely difficult for them in the early stages of disease. And the majority uh, go on to develop a dementia, but not all of them. Psychiatric problems can be a major issue with depression, irritability, anxiety, and apathy. And I'll come back to some of those in a minute. So this is what everyone would recognize as uh, Huntington's disease with the uh, classic features. But uh, early on, when we were talking to patients, or I started doing this 25 years ago, patients would often say that their, uh, or their partners would often say that the patient fidgets in bed at night. And this is often in patients where you can see nothing in clinic. So this made us think that this could be a very important early feature of Huntington's disease. It may actually help you make a diagnosis uh, in the clinic. And so we actually tried to uh, investigate this using ActiWatches. This was in the days before Fitbits, if you can believe there were such days. Uh, so this monitored activity over uh, 24 hours over a seven, 14 day period. And what we found was that patients were moving in bed at night. Now that's a bit odd because if they're moving in bed at night, you shouldn't move in bed at night if you're properly asleep. So this raised the question as to whether these patients actually were properly asleep at night or, and whether sleep was affected as an early feature of hunting disease. So I'm just gonna briefly uh, uh, discuss a study which we published a number of years ago, but we're following up, uh, led by uh, Anna Goodman and Alpar Lazar, where we took people with pre-manifest hunting disease. So these were people who complained of nothing and had no features of hunting disease on examination, age and gender max controls. Uh, we did a metabolic study, which I'll come on to in a minute. And we basically recorded their activity over two weeks. We then locked them in a sleep laboratory for two days and monitored their sleep. Uh, and none of these patients were on medication or complained of anything. We did a whole series of other measures, which I'm not really going to go into. And what we discovered was actually that patients in this pre-manifest stage had abnormalities of sleep. It was quite subtle. Uh, they tended to go to bed earlier, spend longer in bed. Uh, but uh, actually, when we came on to examine it in more detail, it was very disorganized was the sleep uh, they had. So, so, 
there's a radio playing now. Uh, so what we found when we analysed this was that the patients actually uh, had inefficient sleep. So if you monitor sleep in terms of actually uh, how you, if I can check that up actually, uh, 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 if you actually monitor their sleep in terms of looking at the different stages of sleep, REM sleep versus slow wave sleep, we found that actually their sleep organisation was abnormal. So it was more disorganised, it was less efficient, even though they spent longer in bed. And when you actually monitor this against a thing called disease burden score, which gets bigger the closer you are to getting or having Huntington's disease, there was a very strong correlation. In other words, uh, patients who were moving from a pre-manifest to a manifest state were having worsening sleep organisation. Now, this has two major uh, features, two major consequences. One is that many of the early features of Huntington's may be no more than chronic jet lag. So these patients do not sleep properly. So they're rather apathetic, irritable, fidgety with cognitive deficits. It's also possible that this inability to put your brain to sleep properly at night drives the disease process and actually treating sleep may be a way of actually uh, modifying uh, Huntington's disease progression. So sleep abnormalities are an early feature. They may be a helpful way to diagnose it. They may also account for some of the symptoms and be part of the pathogenic pathway. We also noticed in patients that weight loss is a very common feature of Hunter's disease. And we did a study a number of years ago in mice with David Rubinstein and in patients showing that the patients seem to be pro-catabolic. So when they were doing nothing, they seemed to be chewing up their protein and such like in a way which implied there was a fundamental metabolic problem. So in this study, which I've already mentioned, we uh, took our pre-manifest patients and controls uh, we did free living uh, uh, calorimetry by giving them heavy water and monitoring that over two weeks. And then we put them in a calorimetry sealed room for two days and measured uh, large numbers of metabolic factors as well as hormones. And fundamentally, what we found was that there were no changes in their main hormone levels. We couldn't find any changes in hormones which we thought directly related to metabolism. Curiously, we found that their body mass index was actually, their bone mass index, sorry, was rather less uh, than that in controls, and we don't have an explanation for that. But if you follow patients over time, weight loss is an issue. And whilst we can't uh, identify the cause for that, we would say there isn't a fundamental metabolic problem in hunting disease, at least not in the pre-manifest stages, whereas there is clearly a sleep abnormality, which may be important in the expression of that condition. So that's uh, two things that we learned from our patients, if you like. One was about weight loss, one was about uh, movements at night. Also, patients reported that they got lost and disorientated very early in the disease. And so this led us to believe that there may be hippocampal problems in Hunt's disease, which are normally only described in sort of Alzheimer's disease and diseases of that type. Uh, and in order to do this, we set up a new task, which was basically the Morris water maze. This is a task where you hide an object under the water level uh, in the uh, lab. Uh, you then put a series of cues around the side of the room and animals have to learn where those cues are to find the hidden platform. And you can do this in a number of different ways. And we did this using a virtual reality where patients had to find a platform in a virtual swimming pool. And what we found was that in patients with uh, uh, pre-manifest hunting disease and early Huntington's disease, that actually they were extremely poor at this task and behaved in exactly the same way as transgenic mice uh, put under the same uh, task, obviously in a proper water maze as opposed to the virtual one. This was then corroborated using a different task, which is called the Cantab Paired Associates Learning, which also taps into hippocampal function and is very abnormal in early Alzheimer's disease. And more recently, we've done it in, uh, with Neil Burgess in London with a more complicated uh, uh, spatial navigational task, which has also shown this deficit. So this clearly shows that in Hunt's disease, whilst people always talk about problems at the front of the brain and in the striatum, and frontostriatal, there are clearly early hippocampal problems and that those happen again as patients start to move from pre-manifest to manifest, coinciding with sleep abnormalities. And sleep, of course, is very important for hippocampal memory formation. So this starts to link abnormal sleep in early Hunt's disease to abnormal hippocampal function, which may give us a marker of when disease starts as well as giving us some insight into how we actually uh, may be able to better treat and monitor progression in this disease. And finally, the other thing that patients reported, or actually their family reported, that patients were really very, uh, in the very early stages of disease, or even before they have manifest disease, have great difficulty relating to others, which creates problems with employment. 
And so Sarah Mason in my group looked at this with uh, a thing called social cognition. So an example of this is up in the top where you have to look at those eyes and decide what emotion is being displayed by the patient's eyes. Uh, so this is reading the mind in the eyes test. And what we found was that patients in uh, approaching disease onset or in early Huntington's disease had problems recognizing emotions in others. So there is a problem with social cognition, which might explain why they run into relational problems, both in the family and at work. So all of this has told us that if you actually listen to patients in clinic, and for those who work in the lab, this may not be so relevant, but actually listening to patients can often point you in directions for your research, which then reveals abnormalities which have been overlooked by an earlier literature. So now I'm just going to talk in the final few minutes about treatment. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on standard treatments. I need to tell you that there are no real standard treatments for Huntington's disease. There are almost no trials of symptomatic therapy, but everything we do is mainly based on anecdotes and small studies. But essentially, we're quite good at treating the motor abnormalities with these dopamine blocking drugs. But there is now an emerging literature of which we're working on that actually dopamine blockade may have um, detrimental effects in hunting disease whilst helping with some of the motor, it may make some of the cognitive deficits worse. Uh, cognitive deficits we have no treatment for at all. Psychiatric problems we treat in the standard way as we would for anyone with a psychiatric problem. And then other aspects of the disease we treat uh, in standard fashions, uh, particularly the, uh, the weight loss and sleep problems. And one of the challenges in the studies which I sort of alluded to with trying to better treat sleep which would then uh, perhaps we can see whether it's disease modifying is that none of these drugs actually restore normal sleep architecture. They just put people to sleep. So uh, we're having to work on that, but we are doing some studies where we are starting to intervene around sleep. Obviously there are newer treatments which people are investigating, none of which have yet been proven to be disease modifying. The most obvious approach is that which uh, targets the primary problem, which is the abnormal Huntington gene or the abnormal product of that, the messenger RNA or protein. And so many of you will be aware that there's been a very high profile trial uh, run over the last five years, uh, initially by Ionis and more recently with Roche, where they had an antisense oligonucleotide directed against the RNA of Huntington, not mutant Huntington, but Huntington in general. Uh, the initial studies which were published in the New England Journal a few years ago showed that this had the effect of lowering Huntington in the CSF, although there was no clinical benefit in that study. As you all know, that trial was stopped by Roche early this year when they had progressed to a phase three 800 patient study because the risk benefit ratio was not favorable. In other words, the antisense therapy, which was given intrathecally into the CSF, produced no clinical benefit in the patients and indeed tended to produce greater uh, increase in ventricular size, whether that was atrophy or a form of hydrocephalus is unclear. There are other uh, groups working on this, but that big high profile trial sadly failed, although the future for this type of therapy is still there. Uh, none have yet to really uh, prove this as a therapeutic option. The alternative, coming back to where I began, is rather than uh, uh, reduce the production of the abnormal protein, and these are not uh, mutually exclusive, you could try and upregulate the removal of it through autophagy. So David Rubinstein here in Cambridge has spent many years looking at this process in many different uh, diseases, including Huntington's disease. One of the early drugs he identified was a drug used for blood pressure called Raminidine, uh, which we used in an open label study here in 16 patients showing it was feasible, tolerable with some uh, signal of possible efficacy. Uh, we subsequently, David went on to show that there is a better drug for upregulating autophagy, which works very well in these animal models called philodipine, which is a calcium antagonist. And we're about to start a study of philodipine in hunting disease to see whether it's tolerated and whether it has any effect on disease progression and changes in markers of disease activity. Uh, that's obviously not an efficacy study, but we will get some signals to whether this approach has merit. And then finally, there have been approaches to try and just replace what's lost in uh, Huntington's disease uh, by putting back the lost cells. This has been mainly done using uh, human fetal striatal tissue. We were involved in a trial here of five patients which produced no clinical benefit in the patients who were followed over a period of time. And there has subsequently been a French study which has also found no benefit. So replacing cells, I think, is something which has been tried, hasn't been shown to be effective. And given the story which I've told you about the, the compartments which are involved, the extensive pathology which is seen, it seems unlikely that this approach will actually have much merit going forward. Interestingly though, it can show some uh, 
uh, uh, effects which you were not expecting. So this is one uh, patients, these are some patients that were transplanted in America with fetal tissue. Francesca Cicchetti then reported that in these patients, whilst they had surviving transplants, curiously, she found that there was some Huntington within the transplanted area. Now, uh, I saw uh, that there's a great expert on prion protein uh, about to talk to you, uh, but actually this uh, raises questions about in this condition, as with other uh, proteinopathies, more classically thought of as being cell intrinsic, whether there is any spread of protein pathology from one compartment to another. I don't think this is important in Hunt's disease, but it just shows that what we think goes wrong in disease may be slightly different, depending uh, on how you look at it. And some of these new therapeutic approaches show us things that we didn't expect before. So just to conclude, Hunt's disease is a genetic disorder which has a pre-manifest and manifest stage of disease. So uh, you can actually try and target the disease before it's clinically expressed, which has advantages for trialing uh, neuroprotective and neuro and disease modifying therapies. However, the pathology in Hunt's disease is much more extensive than the striatum. And the pathogenesis is probably more complex than thought involving several neuronal compartments and probably several different pathways. Whether protein spread is important, I think is, is contentious. They obviously, uh, as I've also tried to illustrate, that the clinical features of Hunt's disease, whilst there's a classical phenotype, is clearly much more extensive than that. And some of these other features may be very helpful at better defining when the disease begins and tracking disease progression, at least in the early stages. And finally, there are many new treatments which are coming from the lab to the clinic, which are highly uh, exciting, some of which are very specific, including allele-specific silencing in the mutant hunting versus non-specific therapies, such as trying to get sleep back to a more normal state with the hope that that will improve uh, patients' uh, uh, phenotype as well as their pathology in Huntington's disease. So with that, I'll conclude. I'd like to thank all the people in the group who've helped me over the years with all of this work. Uh, I've put up a few of the key collaborators that I've had over the years uh, working on various aspects of this disease. And I think I have a few minutes left if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Barker, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we actually do have a few questions um, pertaining to the therapeutic failures. The first one is, what, what would you outline as the major factors for failure of the clinical trial with antisense nucleotides? So I think the major reason that failed uh, was partly it was where how it was delivered. So it was delivered into the lumbar CSF. So it, it actually then circulated around the brain, but how much it penetrated into the brain, I think, was debatable. The level at which it dropped the Huntington level within the brain and critical areas within the brain is unknown. There are some people who are worried that it may have dropped down wild type Huntington. And so some of the problems people had was because they were deficient in normal levels of Huntington. I don't know whether that's true. Certainly, we had one patient where the, the antisense actually blocked the outflow of the CSF and they developed hydrocephalus and needed to be shunted. So there may have been other problems with the delivery of the agent. So I would say it primarily failed, not because it was intrinsically wrong as a therapeutic approach, but delivery was the issue. Okay, so that partly answers the next question, which is, does the failure of the trial targeting Huntington challenge the understanding of the pathophysiology or were perhaps the patients recruited at the stage when the disease was already too advanced? Yeah, and I'm not so sure about whether they were too advanced. People love this idea that they're too advanced. So amyloid and Alzheimer's, people always say the disease is too advanced. That's why the therapists don't work. I would say probably the amyloid therapists don't work in Alzheimer's disease because it's not the story. It's only part of the problem. And, and, you know, 33 trials tell you it probably doesn't work. So it's more complicated than that. So I think in Hunt's disease, it should work. There's no reason it shouldn't work. But I think delivery is going to be the critical thing. And how much should you knock it down for how long in which sites will be important? Okay. I think we have time for another question. Do presymptomatic carriers of Huntington's disease mutation also display disturbances in social cognition? And if so, how early have the disturbances been seen? Yeah, so I didn't really explain that very clearly. If you look at people who are pre-symptomatic or pre-manifest, then what you find is it, you can do a calculation to predict how close they are to getting the disease. The closer they are to getting the disease, so if you like, within five years of probable disease onset, they start to develop these abnormalities. So we would say that sleep and social cognition and hippocampal deficits appear in pre-manifest patients a few years before they become overt with their condition. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, given the sleep difficulties in people with Huntington's disease, are there similarities between lesions seen in fatal familial insomnia and in Huntington's disease, at least in localization? 
Uh, well, I, 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 yeah, it's a good question as to whether where the sleep abnormality arises, because obviously in familial uh, fatal insomnia, that's, you know, prion disease and, and uh, it, you know, and it probably affects the thalamus. That's why they get it. I don't know quite why patients with Hunt's disease develop this disordered sleep. Um, but I think, you know, there's this whole story about how sleep clears abnormal proteins. So the question is, is this in some way related to why patients with sleep abnormalities progress with Huntington's disease. It's not the whole story, but it may be a contributing factor. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are just on time uh, for really participating in this and for delivering an excellent lecture. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye now. Okay. Now we are seeing the screen of Professor Aguzzi. Hello, Professor. You are still muted. There we go. Okay. Hi, how are you? Great. Let's just, can we, can I begin the announcement? Absolutely. Perfect. So, um, our next presenter is Professor Adriano Aguzzi, who is the professor and director of the Institute of Neuropathology at the University Hospital in Zurich. And in his talk, he will review the current knowledge of the infectivity, neurotoxicity, and neuroinvasiveness of prions, address the challenge posed to medicine by prion strains, and showcase some of his laboratory's recent findings regarding prion biology. So professor, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Lana. Great to be here. And uh, I always uh, love to come uh, to Slovenia. It's a wonderful place. And uh, the, but unfortunately, I'm only here um, uh, uh, virtually. So the uh, what I uh, what I have understood is that most of you are either clinicians or medical students. So I thought that uh, before I dive into hardcore biochemistry, maybe I should uh, give you a bit of uh, an overview of where, what prions are and where we stand with those. And essentially this timeline uh, is taken, oops, uh, what did I do? Yeah, yeah. This timeline is taken from a review article which you may looked up, which I published in Science just a few, few months ago and uh, and essentially the, we have known about prions for a very long time for uh, several uh, centuries uh, by now and uh, and but it was things really picked up um, when uh, in uh, when scrapie which is a prion disease of sheep was recognized to be transmissible and this happened in 1936 uh, very important work by a uh, uh, duo of French scientists, uh, and uh, and then it was really uh, Kuru, you may, uh, which I will talk about, that was discovered in the 60s by uh, Carlo von Geidusek, and then really it was uh, Stanley Prusiner in the uh, in the 80s, so almost 40 years ago, who actually put up uh, the incredibly disruptive and uh, uh, controversial hypothesis that the prion diseases would be caused by an infectious agent that does not contain nucleic acids. And uh, uh, although now this has become the dogma, I cannot stress uh, enough how revolutionary this concept was and also with how much hostility it uh, was received by the people who were studying these diseases who were mostly virologists and uh, you know, and uh, they couldn't actually conceive this uh, the idea that the agent was devoid of nucleic acids because uh, the central dogma of biology is that uh, which has, was formulated by francis crick uh, says that uh, 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 you first need uh, the uh, DNA to encode for uh, messenger RNA that will then encode for proteins and that the flux of information of molecular information goes from DNA to RNA to protein and then of course when uh, retroviruses were discovered it was found that you can also go backwards from RNA to DNA but nobody had ever imagined that, that a protein could actually instruct another protein and uh, without going through a genetics uh, phase. So results that prions do exactly that, but they do it in a very special way, which I will discuss uh, uh, briefly. Now, the, uh, 
Uh, then it was really Charles Weisman, uh, my mentor in Zurich, who discovered uh, how all of this works. And uh, he cloned the gene that encodes for the prion protein that he called PRPC. And then it turns out that PRPC is actually the cellular prion protein, but um, there, uh, the, there is a, a, ver a misfolded and aggregated version uh, that is called PRPSC or PRP scraping, which, uh, uh, which I show here. And uh, you, this is a typical amyloid. You can see here how the beta sheets are folded on top of each other, and the, the whole thing becomes a fibril, and this is actually the infectious prion. And um, several structures have been proposed, and most recently, actually, a bioarchive paper has, shown, uh, has come up just last month showing um, uh, an actual uh, uh, structure derived by solid state and MR spectroscopy that really shows uh, um, how the prions uh, are assembled uh, now, and then, uh, and then actually it was my lab who sh we showed that uh, uh, the cellular prion protein is essential for prion toxicity, and uh, then a lot of other things happened, and uh, and now the field is pretty much over. Now let me just tell you a couple of words about uh, Kuru and uh, um, the so so what is Kuru? Kuru is a disease that affected the. For a population in the northern part of uh, Papua New Guinea, which is an island uh, north of Australia, you see here is Australia, here is Papua New Guinea, and the, this disease was incredibly frequent. It was actually the number one cause of death in uh, Papua New Guinea for several decades, and uh, you can see it here. Actually, it affected mostly children, and uh, the um, terrible disease, uh, uh, wasting disease uh, that. Um, uh, was actually a neurological disease, very similar to, actually, uh, you know, one could say similar to Alzheimer's disease, but much faster, uh, leading to death much, much more quickly. And uh, then it was Carla Congaitis who actually discovered that what was the cause of Kuru. These people who had not been in contact with Western civilization uh, uh, until the 1950s, um, they were living in prehistory. They were living like in uh, the Stone Age. And... Uh, they used to practice ritual cannibalism. So when somebody died in their tribe, they would make a big party and, um, and actually eat the, uh, the dead. And this was meant to be some kind of honoring the dead. But the fact is that this way, they were also transmitting this disease. So Kuru was transmitted through cannibalism. And in fact, uh, uh, the most worrisome thing is that uh, uh, when all of this became clear to the work of Carl Gajdusek and Vincent Sigas and many others, uh, then the Australian government uh, instituted programs uh, for um, educating the people. And in fact, uh, we know that since the 1960s, essentially nobody was being cannibalized in uh, Papua New Guinea any longer. But uh, what uh, still happened is that even in the 40 years later, even uh, uh, in, the, in the third millennium, we have st still been witnesses in cases of Kuru, meaning that the incubation time can be extremely long, can be for several decades. Uh, and then there is uh, Scrabi. Scrabi is in sheep, and, uh, the, and it's a prototypic prion disease of sheep. And in all these diseases, whether in sheep uh, or uh, in uh, humans with Kuru or in patients with Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease or with fatal familial insomnia that was just discussed before, um, the salient feature is spongiosis. And spongiosis means that the brain assumes the, uh, the form of a sponge. And it looks like a sponge because uh, it's full of holes. You see here, this, all these little holes here, the whole brain is completely full with them. And they are intraneuronal. Here you see a nice uh, pyramidal cell with a big nucleus, a nucleolus here, some lipoprusin. Here is the axonal cone. And what you see here is, um, is a vacuole inside the neuron. Now, what is going on? Let's look at the electron microscopy. And uh, there, you actually, the electron microscopy uh, gives you a surprise. What you see is uh, here is a neuronal process. It's a myelinated process. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, the process is blowing up. Uh, and you see that there is a lot of, uh, there is a vacuole. The vacuole is intraneuronal. The, 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 the black here is the myelin sheath. And uh, then sometimes you see some degenerating organelles here. Here you see the, these guys are called multivesicular bodies. And this uh, implies uh, that these vacuoles may actually derive from the endosomal lysosomal compartment. Uh, this seems to be actually blown up lysosomes. So 
effect. We have uh, evidence that this is exactly what it is. And now let me come to uh, spongiform encephalopathy, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or met cow disease. Uh, now, those of you of a certain age know about it, uh, but uh, I just uh, um, made a little uh, inquiry with the medical students uh, of, um, um, in this morning's lecture, and I was a bit shocked to realize uh, that half of uh, today's medical students have never heard of uh, met cow disease. I mean, complete blank, and, uh, but you know, uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, med cow disease uh, was uh, just uh, like COVID is now. I mean, everybody and his brother was talking about med cow disease. You could actually go out in the street uh, and um, take just 10 random people on the street or, uh, and ask them, so what do you think about med cow disease? And they would start telling you, ah, you know, the transgenic models may not completely model the disease. And so it was, it was incredible. And uh, and the reason was because there was a big worry because med cow disease uh, really, it was uh, first uh, uh, identified uh, in the late 1980s in the United Kingdom. The first uh, histopathological confirmation was uh, found in a cow in 1986. Uh, and it was a seminal paper by Wells and Wildsmith, uh, two veterinarians uh, from, the, uh, from the UK uh, National Veterinary Service. And uh, uh, so not even uh, academics, I mean, people just from the veterinary service. Uh, they uh, had a cow that was clearly developed uh, uh, signs and symptoms of dementia as much as a uh, cow can, can get demented. And uh, then they inv uh, investigated the brain and they found all these vacuoles holes and they say, wait a minute, this looks like uh, sheep scraping. So they called it bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And from then on, uh, uh, from the first case, uh, things came up, uh, became exponential. And these are the number, this is the incidence, the number of cases of uh, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy in the United Kingdom every month. And you see that uh, this went up like crazy. I mean, at peak, we were talking like 3,000 3, uh, cows every month uh, coming down with disease. Now, how was the disease transmitted? Well, it was the same thing as with Kuro. It was cannibalism. So what uh, actually what was done is that somebody had this uh, stroke of genius uh, of uh, extracting, because, you know, the cows, uh, when, you, when you slaughter a cow, you know, there is, uh, some parts are go going to human consumption, but that is very little. I mean, it's, uh, pe people like to eat uh, the entrecot and the filet, but actually 90% of the cow is not eaten by people. So people, uh, so somebody came with, up with the idea, well, this is all this wonderful animal protein. Why are we wasting it and throwing it away? Let's recycle it and giving it back to the cows. And, uh, and I should say that this was a very ideological thing because uh, uh, what, what uh, was, you know, the, there was this, uh, you know, very, very, um, very current. I mean, this whole idea that, uh, uh, you know, the, of um, recycling and of, uh, you know, it is a circle of life and uh, you, uh, you don't, uh, you don't throw anything away and uh, uh, you, uh, and uh, you have sustainability, you know, I'm saying this a bit polemically, but what I'm trying to get at is that, you uh, um, I am all in favor of sustainability, but there has to be science behind it. And because if you don't uh, uh, listen to scientists, then you end up with a catastrophe, which is what happened here. No, because uh, the the offals uh, they were then rendered into what was called the meat and bone meal, which is essentially uh, the animal proteins. They were fed back into the cows, and then all the cows started getting sick, and then we had this huge disaster. And uh, and uh, you know, and the worst thing you see that this was recognized pretty quickly, and then the British government installed a feed ban in 1988, and yet the uh, numbers uh, shoot up through the roof uh, because of the incubation time. Because the cows that were already infected here, they developed the disease here, and the incubation time is very long. So that's uh, the one thing that happened, and then. Uh, uh, what everybody was worried about was transmission to humans because humans were actually eating the cows. And indeed, that's uh, the disease that uh, showed up. It's called barium kreutzfeldt jakob disease. And you see here, this is the peak of PSE, and then people started dying. And, uh, and, some, uh, and there, there is bad news and good news. Uh, the bad news, 300 people died. This is terrible for each one of them. What is worse, uh, these were very young people. We don't understand why, but... Uh, Mostly teenagers uh, were, came down with the disease. They all died. There is no cure. 
And, uh, but the good news is that it was 300, you know, it could have been 3 million. So, and in fact, uh, um, we didn't know. And uh, the parallels to COVID are absolutely crazy. You know, I've been, I went through this whole crisis when it happened. And, uh, you know, for me, it's a deja vu. The, the whole, uh, 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 the, the negationism, the politicians uh, uh, disregarding what is going on, uh, the, the measures of public health uh, that are obvious, uh, what needs to be taken, and nobody dares, nobody, uh, you know, when, when all this happened, the, the UK government asked Carleton Guidos, like, what shall we do? And, uh, and this was in 1988, and Guidos said, you have to get rid of all the cows in the United Kingdom. You have to kill them all and start from scratch. And of course, uh, this did not happen. It would have been the only reasonable thing to do, and it would have uh, resolved the crisis. You know, just like the lockdown so with, uh, with COVID. You know, the, it's very you know, COVID is uh, uh, is a disease that takes two weeks. No, so in the theoretical case, that everybody uh, that you have a complete lockdown of entire Europe for two weeks. Well, the disease is gone after that because nobody will get infected. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, so I just say history repeats itself and uh, it's worth uh, recalling the historical memory of what happens in the past because this would help uh, uh, preventing the same mistakes from uh, happening in the future, which is exactly what is happening now. And uh, let me, it's even worse than that. I mean, currently the European Union is considering legislation to reintroduce the animal, so to stop the animal feeding ban and to reintroduce this type of, uh, of cannibalism of giving animal proteins uh, to, um, uh, uh, to farm animals, which I think is the recipe for the disaster. It's going to uh, create again a crisis of PSE. But you know, the people who are now the decisions maker, they are young. They have not seen this stuff happening. So, and this is why uh, this is the main reason why I'm talking about this. Uh, now, uh, let's get away from the politics and talk a bit about the science. Uh, so, what is a prion and how does it work? Well, Prusiner, Stanley Prusiner, Nobel Prize winner, he came up with the idea that, uh, uh, that the prion is PRP scrapey. And PRP scrapey, according to Prusiner's original hypothesis, uh, refined by Charles Weisman, was that. Uh, PRP3 might actually interact with the normal prion protein, which we all have, the PRPC, the cellular prion protein, and then an interaction occurs uh, that will create two molecules of PRP3. Now, these two molecules will feed back into this circle, and then uh, over time, you'll get more and more of, um, uh, of the PRP3. Now, turns out that this is not entirely true. The, the, what really happens is the following. PRP3 monomeric, uh, is misfolded PRP scraping monomeric is not infectious. It does nothing. What it has to do is to assemble a seed or a nucleus. And this is actually the kind of seeds that you have. And once these kind of oligomers have, uh, uh, then the whole thing grows like a crystal because it will bring in additional monomers from this equilibrium. What I forgot to say, there is an equilibrium between the misfolded and the properly folded PRP. But the misfolded PRP will, recru will be recruited in this, in this kind of crystal. They are not really crystals. They're actually, they're actually fibers. Uh, this is amyloid. And so it's a bit like the Huntington amyloid that we were talking about before. There's also differences, but it's uh, similar. And now that is, um, a, a, and now this principle is, uh, uh, so here I'm showing it again because I like it so much. So, so, and I really want to drive home the concept. So where does prion replication occur? You know, in the case of any infectious agent, <coughs> the agent has to replicate. So where does it occur? It occurs at the level of uh, the breakage of the fibril. So here you have a big fibril, and then it breaks. And then you have two fibrils uh, or two oligomers. Now, this is uh, the replicative event. This is where you go from one prion here to two prions here. So the uh, um, now this has huge uh, uh, implications uh, for uh, uh, for therapy, because what it means uh, is that, you know, for many years, people have been trying to find ways to break the fibrils. Well, I can tell you, don't do that. Uh, if you break the fibrils, you will kill your patient. Uh, because uh, if you take one big fibril, that's one, one prion. The prion is the infectious unit. One fibril is one prion. If you make, uh, um, uh, if, you, if you break it uh, and you make uh, a million uh, fragments out of it, uh, you end up with a million prions, so don't do it. It's not advisable. 
what you really should do is actually to prevent the fiber from breaking. So that is actually what works. And so how do you do that? Well, I'll come to this, but let me just tell you one more thing. Now, if you take away, if you just take away this label PRP scrapie and you put a beta, then you essentially have the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. If you take out a beta and put sinuclein, then you have Parkinson's disease, uh, diffuse Levy body disease, uh, sinucleinopathies, multiple system atrophy, and so on and so forth. So the, this means uh, that there is a general uh, concept. Uh, the, the, uh, the, this type of pathogenesis is very common. There is a bunch of diseases uh, that uh, obey to the same type of principle. Now, um, and here I have listed it. This paper uh, I wrote in Nature like 12 years ago. It's already very old. And uh, the number of diseases that obey to this principle is getting longer and longer. And uh, so you have Alzheimer's, you have homeopathies, and as discussed, we also have Huntington. But and, uh, something very exciting that uh, we, uh, we are witnessing now is the following. Uh, I mean, essentially what prions disease do is that uh, the they spread horizontal information. So if you have a structural information, which is essentially the, um, uh, the, the aggregated state of the prion protein, and you can actually transmit this aggregated state to other proteins within the cell, uh, to, to siblings, essentially. Now, this is a great way of transmitting information. So it would be surprising if, uh, nature would have not found a way to use this mechanism for something interesting, for something perhaps beyond just disease. And indeed, it turns out that there is a bunch of, um, of um, uh, let's see, oops, oops why can't I do that? So there is a bunch of um, of uh, uh, of diseases uh, that uh, um, no no sorry sorry there is a bunch of physiological mechanisms like for example suppression translation and termination suppression very important for yeast and uh, this is transmitted by something that works like a prion but it's a good thing for the yeast to have it so it turns out that there are actually good prions that do not transmit disease but they actually transmit. Uh, physiological properties. And these physiological amyloids are something very, very important in many instances. They were found, I mean, this was, as I said, this paper is from two years ago. And uh, this, uh, and, uh, but you know, things have moved on. Uh, and now we have also things happening like this uh, in, uh, in humans as well. Now, um, so, okay, so this is the, the general concept. Now I want to uh, tell you how to prove the prion hypothesis. I told you that when Stanley Brusner first uh, um, formulated this hypothesis, uh, he was laughed at. I mean, people were not uh, uh, were not even prepared to consider uh, uh, the idea of Brusner. So, so Charles Weisman and I really set out to devise an experiment to disprove uh, the hypothesis, which is actually how you should do science. You should never try to prove your uh, pet hypothesis. You should try to disprove. So the, the way Chask uh, decided to do, this was at the beginning when people were starting to make knockout masks. No? So the technology had just been invented by which you could actually inactivate any gene in the genome and then ask the concept. So the idea was the following. And now the, the, the Prusiner hypothesis said that you have the normal prion protein and that the pathological prion protein comes in and then it will transform the normal prion protein into a likeness of itself. So the corollary to that is that if you were to have an organism that does not contain the normal prion gene, then you shouldn't be able to actually provoke disease in this, gene, in the, in this organism. So first of all, it was Hans Rudi Bühler in the lab of Charles Weisman who made the PRP knockout mice. And the first surprise was the knockout mice are fine. They will, they do not, they, uh, they, they have four legs, they have a tail, and, uh, you know, I don't show the face of the mouse because, you know, privacy legislation and uh, I have to be careful with our uh, animal protectionists. But the fact is uh, you can take out uh, the, um, the gene that it calls for the, uh, for the prion protein and the mice will be fine. And then the next experiment, which was actually the really exciting one was to ask, okay, what happens if you uh, now infect these mice with prions? And the answer is nothing happens. These mice are protected, which shows that you need the normal prion protein in order for the disease uh, to develop. 
And then, uh, so that was uh, ancient history. These, all these things uh, we were doing almost 30 years ago. But then I spent 15 years trying to understand the following. When cows eat prions, uh, the prions that produces a disease in the nervous system. And I got really interested in understanding how is it possible that if, a, if you're just talking about a protein, how can this protein possibly enter the gut and then eventually end up in the brain? And uh, so, uh, the, as I said, this was 15 years of research, but I will just uh, mention uh, a couple of um, ancient papers where we found that actually B lymphocytes uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the immune system are absolutely necessary for all this. Uh, and the B lymphocytes uh, create an environment that will allow prions to thrive in the germinal centers of uh, the um, uh, lymphoid organs, and then uh, it is the sympathetic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system that bring the prions into the brain, and uh, this works uh, through, um, through um, uh, uh, was shown by my host of Marcus Latzel, who is now a professor in, of neuropathology in Hamburg, and uh, Marco Prinz, who is now a very famous microglia specialist in, um, in Freiburg. And they showed that uh, if you do a chemical sympathectomy or an immunosympathectomy with antibodies against nerve growth factor, you can actually prevent uh, the um, disease from marching to the brain. Right, so I think uh, I'm 25 minutes into my lecture. I think I will... Uh, Leave it at that and uh, stop now. Um, I could probably go on for until tonight, uh, but I will uh, <laughs> I will not do that and uh, take some questions. Uh, you have uh, intentionally uh, mostly um, focused on old things uh, because I think that you probably may not have an opportunity to hear the old stories very often. So this may I thought that this might be more interesting for you than talking about the latest biochemistry of prions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we actually ran a short poll during your presentation where we asked our listeners whether the outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy changed their dietary habits, and most of them said that it did not. Neither did it mine, but uh, I, I, I love eating um, uh, uh, steaks, uh, but you know, but uh, I do a lot of dangerous things, so you should not take me as an example. <laughs> okay. I also do mountain biking down uh, some crazy downhill trails, and so that's also not very healthy. Right. Although it probably won't cause prion disorders. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions. Um, number one, so speaking of COVID-19 parallels, this um, audience member says that they read somewhere that prions can spread through aerosols. Is this true? Yes, that was the discovery of uh, Matthias Heikenbelder in my laboratory some 10 years ago and uh, in collaboration with Lothar Stitz. And th there we did a super dangerous experiment and we did it actually in a biosafety level four facility because it was so dangerous. Uh, and uh, level four means that you have to uh, uh, gear up uh, with, like an astronaut essentially. And then you have like a tube that gives you the oxygen. And uh, what we did was to nebulize prions. Uh, so we had a machine that would create an aerosol from prions, and then we expose mice uh, to this uh, uh, nebulized prions. So, so uh, you can't get much more dangerous than that. And, uh, and uh, the question was, uh, can we actually infect the mice? And the answer was shocking. We infect the mice. 100% all mice got infected within 10 seconds of exposure to the aerosol. So it's very clear that um, aerosolized prions are horribly infectious. I think that this has a lot of consequences also for, uh, um, uh, for uh, biosafety, for example, in the lab. And so it means that you really have to uh, uh, take precautions to avoid uh, aerosols in the lab. And, um, um, but at the same time, I should say that this is when you aerosolize prions. I mean, if you, uh, for example, if you take care of a patient with Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease, uh, there is no infectivity, there are no aerosols. So, so for clinical purposes, uh, this is not very relevant. But for the lab, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is whether unbroken prion polymers or fibers are also neurotoxic. Uh, to some extent they are, and uh, we have, I mean, in the last five years, I got really interested in what drives toxicity, because actually the 
stoichiometrically, the amount of prions uh, in, uh, um, in the brain is very small. I mean, there are very, very few, uh, you know, if you think of uh, systemic amyloidosis, like for example, transthyretin amyloidosis or even uh, 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 AA amyloid, uh, you know, you have, you know, you have the spleen, you have splenomegaly, the spleen becomes uh, like two kilograms. And so there, the, uh, there is so much amyloid that it will mechanically compress the cells and destroy the tissue. In the prion disease, that does not happen. I mean, the amount of prions are uh, minimal, they are infinitesimal. So, um, so then the question arises, what is it? Why is it so toxic? Turns out there are several receptors uh, that uh, transduce toxicity, and we have discovered just one, uh, and uh, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, um, unfortunately, I cannot tell you the uh, the name of the receptor. Well, I, I mean, I could tell you, but then afterwards I would have to kill you. So I prefer not to. <laughs> the, Please not. Right, and uh, so, but uh, but stay tuned because this is a very exciting story. I mean, it's a very specific receptor, and uh, and the, and it's one of the things that drives toxicity. Yeah. Okay. And just a follow-up question to this one, are there any ways to prevent broken fibrils from keeping on growing? Yeah, and uh, uh, that is something that I was planning to talk about, but then I got so enthusiastic about the other stories that I didn't really have the time to talk about this. But yes, uh, you may want to look at uh, the paper of uh, Herman et al. in uh, uh, Science, Translational Medicine, published a couple of years ago, where he found a strategy actually of hyperstabilizers. So, so these are molecules, uh, they're, they're polythiophenes. These are molecules that can actually bind to prion fibrils and will prevent them from breaking. So the, uh, so the fibril become extremely protease resistant, but they lose infectivity. And, the, uh, and this uh, does not completely cure the mice, but it really delays uh, the onset of clinical disease by more than twice uh, uh, the time. Uh, so, so these are promising molecules. Thank you very much. We're out of time. We need to move on to the next lecture, but I'll contact you via email because we have one more question. All right. You know where to find me. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Professor. Goodbye. Take care. And our uh, final guest for the workshop is Professor Holger Wille, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry Center for Prions and Protein Folding Diseases at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry in Alberta, Canada. And his lecture will offer a structural biologist's view of neuroscience that has led his group to create a structure-based prion vaccine. Professor, the stage is yours. All right, thank you for the invitation. It's too bad I can't be there in person, but I think I can give you an interesting uh, continuation of actually what Adriano just was giving in his, <clears throat> his introduction. So as a structural biologist, uh, view on neuroscience, of course, we're looking at protein and protein misfolding diseases. And in particular, I've been working on, on the prion diseases for quite some time as well. <clears throat> if I have enough time at the end, I also will give you a little bit of an outlook how we can translate the, the structural biology insights into Alzheimer's disease into potential vaccines on that end. <clears throat> uh, before I can, hold on. Before I can go into, I just have to disclose that the most thing I'm going to tell you today, we have filed a patent for it. We would like to commercialize it, but nothing much has happened there. And this is also list of the support we have received. Now, what is a prion? So as a structural biologist, if you have a view on this one, so this is a normal protein. And if this normal protein, of course, has some function like enzymes, there's moving parts to it. And so uh, this is a normal view as you would see it uh, for a protein. Now, if a protein <clears throat> starts to behave really ab abnormally and goes into, con into dangerous conformation, this is what would be happening. So this is a view of a, of a protein that misfolds into dangerous conformation, and this is essentially what a prion is. Now, I don't have to introduce the prion disease since Adriano has covered this one quite, quite well. Uh, I can really focus on the structural biology now. So the structure of the cellular prion protein of the healthy form has been studied the first by uh, Roland Rieck and many others, and they have published the structure. And so here we see an overview com combining lots of data. So it's a properly folded protein with lots of alpha helices, some post-translational modifications. So we understand this protein reasonably well. Now, the problem, of course, when you, when you try to go into for the diseases, 
Uh, what does the structure of the infectious prion protein look like? And there we were less certain what it looks like, particularly we didn't have any, any higher resolution data until very recently. And so we came up with models. And what this slide does, it shows, gives you an overview of the different models that have been published over the years. It covers all the essential models here. And in particular, the one which was published <clears throat> just a couple of years ago by Giovanni Spagnoli and collaborators, uh, I think has a, a great interest to me, and I will show you later uh, in a few slides why I think that one is there. It is a particular <clears throat> fold of the protein, and I don't think that the other ones are that much relevant for it. Now there's a new structure that was just published <clears throat> this year, and it's still uh, going to come out officially in November. It's available now in molecular cell, which is a very different structure. And so there, I have some problems with it, and I will explain that one to you in a moment. So this is this comparison of these two structures or the model. <clears throat> and this model is what's called a four-rung beta solenoid. So this is one molecule of PAP in the infectious conformation, at least according to this, this model. And the, the, the protein goes round and round. So one molecule, if you think about a protein fibril, an amyloid fibril, would have a height of 19.2 angstroms. Now this was our model and lots of my work that I'm going to describe to you was based on this model. Now, the new structure that came out, and there was a similar model <clears throat> for it as well, which is a parallel in register intermolecular beta sheet structure, or PIRBS for short. And each molecule is stacked right on top of each other exactly in register, and the fiber axis is this way. So each molecule only rises by 4.8 angstrom in this one. Now, this is an experimental structure, so this is very beautifully done, but I do have some problems with it. Now coming back to the idea how to translate these insights into immunotherapy for prion diseases. Now people have been trying to do this one for a long time. And <clears throat> so PAPC and recombinant PAP has been used as an antigen and it would drive substrate reduction. As in self-antigen, of course, there's problems with autoimmunity, so it's not without problems. PAPSC itself, I mean, while it is disease specific, cannot be used as an antigen. As a, uh, as a vaccine because it's infectious, you would infect the organism. And attenuated prions <clears throat> cannot be made because then you misfold the protein, it's not really the prion state anymore. So like attenuated viruses as we use in other vaccines, <clears throat> this one doesn't work for the prions. Now people have then used linear, linear peptides based on the PAP sequence, and it could also drive the substrate reduction. But again, they are self-antigens, and so there's autoimmunity problem in, involved there and often linear peptides are structurally undefined. So they also lack specificity. Now, disease specific antigens would be great. If they can mimic the structure of PAPSC, you get the specificity that way. <clears throat> they would not be infectious, but they're difficult to define in absence of a structure. <clears throat> so this is where we, we started in this one. Um, six years ago, this was a, the, one of the ideas that came up, this four-rung beta solenoid idea is, has been around for quite a while. And my colleague Jesus Rikina made this crude drawing of how this one could look like, where would the residues of the sequence of PAP line in, in such a <clears throat> three-dimensional structure. And my grad student, Andrew Feng, used this one as a starting point, trying to define which residues in such a structure would be on the surface of the protein. And of course, what's on the surface is exposed to the immune system. So this could be the target for a vaccine, a structure-based vaccine. <clears throat> and so this is what he selected. He, he thought that these residues highlighted in green and cyan would be on the <clears throat> surface of the protein, while the ones that are not highlighted would be pointing into the interior of the protein. He made this, <clears throat> this idea based on, on the folding properties of a beta solenoid, which has a particular folding rules that we will apply to this one. And if you look at the linear sequence of, <clears throat> of, the, of the protein, in this case, it's white idea, PAP, you see that these residues are discontinuous and far, far apart from each other. Now, if we look at the structure of PAPC, or in this case, it's a recombinant PAP, these seven amino acids that Andrew picked, they're also not located on the surface together. As you see, some are on, 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 in one of the alpha helices <clears throat> here on the surface, while the other residues are on the m terminal region here on the surface, so they're far apart from each other. They do not form an epitope whatsoever. Now, if we look at this four-rung beta solenoid model, in this model, these seven residues, they actually come to lie on top of each other on, and I guess you can see here on two rungs of the beta solenoid structure that was proposed in this model. <clears throat> and they're all on the surface of the model 
in and pointing outwards. So this looked rather promising. And <clears throat> what we've done, we've used these residues on a scaffold protein. And so here we use this fungal protein called HEDS, and Adriano had mentioned this one in his presentation as well, which is a completely harmless fungal protein <clears throat> involved in heterocarion compatibility in this fungus, so normal business for this one. It's properly folded. We have a high resolution structure so we can see exactly where each residue is, which is on the surface, with, <clears throat> which one can be, we can manipulate. A lot of studies have been done, and so it was a very great tool for us. And what we have done is we have taken these seven amino acids that I had highlighted in the previous slide and inserted them into the sequence of the head S protein. And we've inserted them in a discontinuous way in such a way that they are ex so, uh, exposed on the surface of this protein and not in the interior. So the residues that we did not change here, they're actually facing into the interior of this head S protein and they're necessary to keep the folded scaffold of the protein intact. And so this is what this manipulated vaccine <clears throat> fiber would look like uh, as a model. The, another advantage of it is this protein also forms amyloid fibers quite readily, and we use the fibrillization as a quality control. So only samples that still produce these fibers are actually used for our vaccine trials. And going forwards, we had some candidates that we made that never fibrillized, we could never do them. And of course, we did not use them for any further studies. Now we also go forward, we use the traditional immunization <clears throat> schedule. So we take these mice, uh, took their pre-immune serum, next day they were primed with a priming dose of the antigen, and then we used three <clears throat> further boosts and had then in the end collected the, the post-immune serum. So when we took the serum and we used crude serum for this one and used it in a competition ELISA, and we used uh, chronic wasting disease, which is another one of these prion diseases, chronic wasting disease infected brain homogenate and uninfected brain homogenate, and in this competition, Eliza, we could see <clears throat> that it was very well recognized while the uninfected brain homogenate was not recognized. We had also immunized mice with our head S uh, scaffold construct that we had used. And of course the mice immunized with that one were not able to distinguish between the infected and uninfected brain homogenates. And this uh, specificity for uh, the ability to recognize <clears throat> the infected brain homogenate was seen in eight out of eight mice while four out of four mice with the controls gave just an unspecific response. So there's a whole side story here. We used these mice then, of course, to took the spleen and made monoclonal antibodies. And these monoclonal antibodies have shown specificity for the infectious prion protein in quite a few studies, but I have taken out these slides because I don't have time for them. Now, <clears throat> how to test the efficacy of this vaccine? In this case, we use gerstmann strausser schenker disease, which is a very rare genetic prion disease based on mutations in the PMP gene. The incidence is only one in 10 million per year. It's, there's a couple of mutations, known mutations that cause the disease, and the proline to leucine and codon 102, uh, 102 is the most common one, and it's also the one that we used <clears throat> for our trials. There's a transgenic mouse model that was made available to us by Glenn Telling's laboratory from Colorado State University. And we use that model in our efficacy trial and the data I'm going to show you in a moment. For the immunization schedule, we used exactly the same thing we had done before. We used different adjuvants and I showed some data on that one as well. Now in these mice, when you take these mice and they produce a mutated form of the prion protein with this GSS mutation, and mouse codon is codon one or one because mice have one fewer residues in their sequence, so it's the same mutation as the P102L I was just talking about, so you will see the P101L signature everywhere now. And these mice overexpress a mutated form of this protein, and based on the, this mutated form, they start to develop disease at the age of 177 days. Uh, the early disease symptoms are ataxia, circling, hunchback, scruffy coat, plastic tail, it's, it's a whole range of them. None of them are, of course, specific, but as is the progressive disease, <clears throat> we can then see that, of course, they progress and they have to be put down soon thereafter. So we know it's a prion disease, and of course, we can analyze samples from, from these animals. Now, this is the unimmunized control. When we took these mice and we immunized them just with the scaffold, had as construct that we, that we had, as you see, these mice do not get any benefit from it. They get the disease at 161 days, which is essentially the same, maybe even a bit faster than, than the unimmunized controls. But the mice that received our vaccine candidate, they stayed healthy until about almost 450 days. 
So this is a 250% extension in health span of these mice. At this, at this age, at 450 days of age, they do start to develop the disease. But then again, you have to think they were producing the mutated form, overexpressing the mutated form of the prion protein throughout their life from the beginning. And we only immunize them in this very first <clears throat> period here. And then we, we just let it run to see what happens in these. Also, <clears throat> to analyze what was happening, we then, of course, measured the antibody titers. We measured the, the post-immune antibody titer that we collected. And when we <clears throat> had to put down these animals, we, we basically collected post-mortem antiserum from these animals as well to test it. Now, when we tested these, <clears throat> these antiserum, it was very clear that they had very different titers. You see the post-immune and the post-mortem. So there is a factor of 100 reduction in the antibody titers in these mice. And of course, it's not a surprise <clears throat> because um, we know the older mice, same as with people, uh, the immune system is, is weakening with age. And of course, they also the, <clears throat> there have been hundreds of days in, in between the immunization and when the uh, these animals finally got sick. So the immune response also weakened. And so the next trial is, of course, we will we'll try to boost these mice and see if we can extend the health span of these mice <clears throat> by increasing the immune response that way. Now, the other thing which we did in the first experiment, because we did not know how good an antigen <clears throat> our, our vaccine would be, we used Freund's adjuvant. Now, our, our animal protocol did allow us to use this one, but it's quite toxic, so it's not, not anything that would be relevant to any clinical trials or it would not be able to use this one in humans at all. So also we used some other, <clears throat> some other adjuvants to see how they work. And so this is work from Madeline Fleming in my lab, and you see she immunized in these mice together with our prion vaccine and used alum, QS20, QS21, these are the data from Florence, or used no adjuvant at all. And when these mice were aged, you can see that the, again, the no vaccine ones, of course, as I said, onset is at 177 days. And as you see, alums, Florence, and QS21, they all give a very, very nice protection, extended protection of these in these mice. Even no adjuvant gives a protection, but it's less because the immune response, as you can see from the curve, is also reduced, of course. <clears throat> now, there's a number of on, uh, additional trials that are ongoing with different prion species, uh, prion, different species that we're trying this one on, <clears throat> and of course, different prion diseases to see if we can and to how efficacious our vaccine, vaccine is in these cases <clears throat> to see how far we can go with this one. Now, at this stage, I want to take a side tour. And as a structural biologist, uh, of course, I'm very excited about all the structures that have been published about um, fibular structure of a beta, fibular structures of the tau protein, which then form pair ticket filaments, and fibular structure of the alpha synuclein protein. We have these, this richness of structures there. And so we thought we can use the same tool and the same approach that we've taken to devise this prion vaccine candidate that I just told you about in order to make vaccine candidates uh, for these proteins and use the same approach to see if, if we can extend this, this idea into these diseases. And of course, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are the really common ones compared to the prion diseases, which are quite rare to that. So I'm just going to show you a few slides. <clears throat> and this is work that is brand new. This is really out of the press. <clears throat> these data are uh, not published yet, and it will take some while before we can publish them. So what we've done here, which is again the same thing that we've done with the prion protein, so we've looked at the structure that was published for the pair filaments, the tau protein, and we have defined the surface exposed residues. You can see them here highlighted in red. Of course, we had different candidates that we made. We used these residues and transplanted them into the head S scaffold. And here you see one of these vaccine candidates where these residues that originated from the tau protein and on the surface of the tau protein, now on the surface of this tau C4 in the vaccine candidate. And what we've done that one, we've used, again, wild type mice, immunized them with this tau C4 candidate, collected the pre-immune serum and post-immune serum, did the whole, whole spiel again from these things. And now we wanted to see, uh, can this one recognize the disease? form of the, of the tau protein. Now, here I want to briefly introduce a competitive, <coughs> uh, competitive ELISA because it's a little bit complicated. Otherwise, you don't understand this figure I'm going to show you in a moment. So in the competitive ELISA, we coat our, our, our wells with our antigen, with our vaccine uh, candidate. 
Somebody is in the line. Okay. And then we use our antiserum, polyclonal, secondary antibody, and then we have brain homogenates as our sample. And we use either patient-derived brain homogenate or non-neurologic controlled brain homogenates. And so it will contain, of course, a lot of native proteins and will co contain aggregated forms of a beta and tau, particularly if we look at Alzheimer's disease, <clears throat> brain homogenates. And if we run these assays, you see here now, if we just take a non-neurologic control, our polyclonal antiserum, <clears throat> of course, our, poly our control does not contain the aggregated form, so our antiserum should not bind to it. It should bind completely only to, <clears throat> to the antigen, which is coated to the bottom of the well. Our secondary antibody will react strongly to it, and we get a high OD as a readout. If we now have, instead of control brain, we use an Alzheimer disease brain homogenate, then if our anti antigen works to induce a specific immune response to it, <clears throat> some of these antibodies should bind to the aggregated protein in, in the homogenate that we put on there, and much fewer antibodies available to bind to the, to the coated antigen to the plate. When you put on the secondary antibody, you will get a much reduced <clears throat> uh, signal with, with a substrate. And now this is what we get with our tau C4 under serum. So we had, again, as I showed, remember I showed you the tau C4 uh, vaccine candidate that we, that we had designed and created. If we test it against non-neurologic brain homogenates, and these are brain homogenates from patients who died of other diseases, <clears throat> Um, of course, I do not have that information in detail. And so this is a very strong immune response that we obtain there because the, antis antibody in the antibodies in this antiserum cannot recognize any aggregated tau because there is presumably none present. Now here we see five, <clears throat> five brains from regular or slowly progressing Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see, the immune response is drastically reduced because the <clears throat> the, the brain homogenate, of course, absorbed some of the, the antibodies that were raised against our tau C4 antigen. And so this reduction is a sign that we do have some specificity in our <clears throat> with our antigens, which is very promising. We also tested uh, five brain homogenate from rapidly progressing Alzheimer's disease, which is another subtype of Alzheimer's disease. But nonetheless, we do see basically the same reduction here showing that our tau C4 vaccine candidate might actually work against both of these forms, which would be very exciting. We also use hamster brain as a, as a completely controlled, homogenate, different species, but uninfected, <clears throat> nothing happened there. And you see, it's also a relatively high, <clears throat> uh, high exposure, so the antibodies have not been absorbed by this antigen. Now, this is a tau protein. Obviously, we also have a beta protein quite prominently in Alzheimer's disease. And there's again a whole range of structures, and we used one of these structures. We looked again at the surface exposed residues in this <clears throat> A-beta structure. You can see them here. We transplanted these, just the surface exposed outside facing residues, into our head S scaffold. You see the A-beta C4 vaccine candidate created the same way with the same quality control, all these steps. And then we use this one to immunize mice. And the polyclonal antiserum that we uh, obtained with the A beta C4, the A beta C4 antiserum, test them against the same brain homogenates that I just showed you in the, in the previous ELISA slide. And again, the non neurologic control brain homogenates, human samples, <clears throat> cannot absorb these antibodies. We get a strong reaction because the antibodies now can bind to the substrate at the bottom of the plate. But if we, instead of control brains, we use either slow Alzheimer's disease or rapid Alzheimer's disease brain homogenates, <clears throat> these antisera antibodies in the antisera are absorbed, so we get a lower readout, and again showing us that our beta C4 antiserum seems to be working and recognizing <clears throat> the, the beta fibrils in the brain homogenous from these Alzheimer's disease patients. And again, the hamster control is again is another negative on the side there. So this looks very interesting, very promising. We now have to, of course, think about how we can do uh, efficacy trials in this one. There are some caveats there, but I don't have time to go this way into detail. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, <clears throat> the beta C solenoid <laughs> model okay. for the structure of PAP assay allowed us to design structure-based vaccine candidates targeting both animal and human prions. I only showed you one uh, FXC trial results based on the GSS <clears throat> transgenic mouse line, and we saw a, a drastically extended health span in this mouse line, extended by 250%. Uh, obviously, this was the best result. Others are still ongoing, and we will see how well they, they do. 
Um, there, there's other <clears throat> diseases we're targeting now, so there's a lot of work going on based on the results that we obtained on this GSS mouse model. It's very exciting. And then we use the very same uh, principles to create vaccine candidates for Alzheimer's disease and also Parkinson's disease. I did not touch that one with any data today, <clears throat> but there's another project that's ongoing in the lab. And we want to see if we can actually use this, this approach to make vaccines for any of these diseases, which of course would be great if they should work. Now in the end, I just have to thank all the people in my lab. Of course, this is an old lab picture since we couldn't take one and <clears throat> new ones. These are the people in red that, that helped with this project I mentioned today. And of course, a lot of collaborators helped with this one as well. And last but not least, I have to thank the funding agency which paid for all the stuff that we do. So there's quite a few for the, all these projects. And <clears throat> thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor. We do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is, how would you choose a target population for vaccinations in humans for a rare disease such as GSS? And does it even make sense to try and prevent it? Or is it just a model for other more common diseases? Yeah, for actually GSS, since this is a genetic prion diseases, um, it's an advantage for us, obviously not for the people who carry the mutation, but there are the, the people who have this mutation in their family, um, many of them ha have the PIP gene sequence, so they know if they are carrier or not carrier, and particularly for the carriers that are pre-symptomatic, meaning they are years before the normal onset of disease, this might be if it should work, and of course we, we don't know if it works in humans, right now it only works in these mice, <clears throat> but if it should work in humans, it might give them an, an extended health span, so they might live to much longer age, than they would normally have with this mutation, since we know roughly the onset for the different mutations. Uh, obviously, it will take some time to prove this one that this works and to get to the stage that we're actually allowed to test it. But actually in these rare diseases, it's the one where we, we have the easiest chance of actually getting it to do people because the carriers know that they have the mutation and they're eager to, to try anything because the, the outlook for them for the longer future is not good. The sporadic disease is a more difficult one, particularly for the prion diseases, how rare they are, who would take a vaccine against them when you only have such a rare chance of getting the disease. If we talk about Alzheimer's disease, of course, it's a different story altogether since mm -hmm. we know the incident of Alzheimer's disease in old age is quite high. So if, if you could take the disease, the vaccine, maybe you would have to take it in your 50s, maybe even earlier. Obviously it would be almost impossible and definitely beyond the scope of my career to prove this one. Just imagine a clinical trial where the duration of the trial is 20 years plus before you have this one. But then again, if, you're not, if you don't try, you will have not a treatment or prophylaxis for Alzheimer's disease. So we have to see if we can get this one to work out. I already know I will have to hand this one off to one of my students to, do the, to finish this project because given the, the timelines of this one, this will go on for quite a while. Right. And another question is based on your estimation, how far from translation to clinic is the tau vaccination? No, oh, that one is I showed you the results just as I came out. We haven't <clears throat> we haven't even begun a, an efficacy trial in a mouse model. Okay. There's a problem that so far the mouse models are not any good. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, we're testing them and we, we are not seeing a good mouse model yet. So we have a problem that we don't have an animal model that works very well. I'm st I still have hopes to overcome this problem, but this is, this is a caveat. And of course, then we have to wait a year or two before we have that result. And then we could start to think about what the next, mo next model is, and then before going to clinical trials so again. So this is a major undertaking. And I will definitely have to look for collaborators to, to move this one forward because it's such a big project. Uh, this one is quite early still. Well, thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for a wonderful lecture. Uh, so far, there are no more questions, but if I receive any, I'll be sure to let you know via email. All right. Sounds good. And, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everyone who tuned in to the workshop. I hope it was as illuminating for you as it was for me. Um, we now have a break planned until 7 when uh, please join us again for the Andrei Oton Zhupancic Memorial Lecture with Dr. Sonia Valab, followed by the Neuroscience and Society Dialogue event. 
um, we have added a button for a simultaneous translation of the Memorial Lecture and Mirror Science and Society Dialogue event into Slovene. It should be located under the presenter screen below, um, so under the live stream. But to see it, you'll need to refresh your browser window. So thank you again for to everyone who listened and of course to all the presenters and we'll see you back here at seven o'clock. Bye-bye.